Good evening, everybody. And uh, it's 6.30 and I should commence this meeting of the Development Control Committee in virtual session. For the benefit of the members of the public watching or participating in this meeting, I'd like to explain who everybody is. My name is Councillor Paul Miller and I'm the chairman of this committee. This committee meeting is being held virtually in accordance with the Council's rules for virtual meetings, which reflect the published government regulations implementing the Coronavirus Act. The meeting is being streamed live on YouTube and will also be available to view after the meeting has finished. Councillors who sit on this committee and who will be making the decisions on the applications before us are identified by name on the screen. Ward councillors addressing this committee will be introduced by name. Can I ask the officers who will be advising the committee to introduce themselves and their role? Good evening, Chair. My name is Mike Townsend. I'm the Planning and Development Manager. And just to say, Chair, that Lucy Page is also presenting this evening. She's just oh, having some you. difficulties coming into the meeting. Oh, and Lucy? I'm Bernadette. I'm Democratic Services Officer. Thank you, Bernie. Um, Anne Greaves, legal, but unfortunately I don't seem to have a camera again. Okay, Anne, thank you very much. The Development Control Committee is a regulatory committee and not a political meeting. The committee will be assessing the material brought before us and listening to the representations made and will make decisions based on planning reasons. In reaching these decisions, we are guided by national and local planning policy and guidance. I understand that planning decisions can be emotive and ask that everybody remains polite and professional and patient throughout this meeting in case of any slight delay in presentations. At this point, I'm gonna mention that the uh, Basin Stoking Borough Council had some IT issues off site. Um, it was nothing to do with the council this morning uh, we do have a contingency if uh, we are interrupted by IT con connectivity during this meeting. I'll now remind both members and officers of the procedures that we'll use as the meeting is virtual. Unless speaking, officers will have their video switched off to provide clarity as to who the committee members are uh, for those watching and participating. At this point, can I ask all officers present to switch off their video? The officers present will only switch on their video link during the item that they are presenting or when they wish to be invited to speak by me as the chair. For this virtual meeting, councillors should observe the normal rules of behaviour under the member code of conduct and ensure they are not disturbed during the meeting. Can members ensure that their mobile phones are now switched off or on silent? Can members of the committee turn on their video link during the meeting and keep their microphones muted unless they've been invited to speak by the chair? Members are reminded if they switch off their video link or move away from the camera, they will be treated as leaving the meeting and will not be able to take part on any vote on the item under this discussion. Members can indicate their wish to speak by raising their hand and should only speak when I as chair invite them to do so. When we move into debate of the application, may I ask all committee members to avoid repetition and keep any comments on each agenda item to a maximum of four minutes. As chair, I will confirm the name of any visiting speaker at the appropriate time in the agenda before they address the committee by audio link. Councillors should state if they have any declaration of interest or if they have predetermined any item on the agenda, that they are leaving the meeting and switch off their video link. They can then switch on their video link again and rejoin when I call the next agenda item. Where a member of the committee has a predetermined position on an application and has registered to speak under the public speaking scheme, they will stand down from the meeting and will only be able to participate as a visiting councillor by audio link. They will then rejoin the meeting as a member of the committee once the application has been determined. At the appropriate time, I will invite speakers to contribute to the meeting by audio link in the order set out in the update paper, 
but I reserve the right to reorder the speaking in the event that technical difficulties occur. I would ask each speaker to confirm their name and interest in the item before commencing their contribution. I will ask that points made by visiting speakers are material planning considerations relating to facts. And then I ask all speakers, including visiting members, to speak clearly and to keep points made on the application to material reasons. Any questions from members to, of the committee to speakers should be related to matters of fact related to the application and not opinion. No further dialogue between members of the committee and speakers will be permitted once questioning is finished. All speakers will be reminded of the permitted speaking time and will be advised when they have one minute remaining. Voting will be taken by roll call and I will confirm the recommendation that is to be voted upon before the voting begins. When each member unmutes their microphone to vote, can they leave a small pause before speaking to allow their vote to be heard? Each member will then indicate whether they are for or against the recommendation or whether they wish to abstain. Hopefully we'll not have any IT problems, I've already explained that, but can I remind councillors that if their connection is lost, that they should immediately advise the democratic support officer and use their meeting link to access the meeting again. A bit long, but we have to do it. Right, go on to the main agenda. And uh, the main agenda, number one, is apologies for absence and substitutions. I have one uh, apology submitted from Councillor McCormack that's relating to Councillor Grant. Do I have any other apologies or substitutions? Nope, thank you very much. Are there any declarations of interest on items in the agenda? I see none. There are no urgent matters notified to me. And we come to the minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of February, to, uh, 2021. I'll move that the minutes uh, are accepted unless there is any observation as to the accuracy of those minutes. I see none, thank you. We now move to applications and Taking this from the update paper, uh, we have, could Mr. Wood please check in? And if you could just hold your counsel for a minute while the officer introduces the application. Thank you, Chair. This application is for full planning permission via enabling development for works to the listed barn for agricultural and ancillary residential storage use, conversion and extension of former stable barn to form one four bedroom dwelling, demolition and part demolition of farm buildings, lean to extension and single storey extension at Fremantle Farm, North Oakley and a combined application which is outline permission for the erection of seven dwellings as enabling development on a site adjacent to Galley Lane Headley with all matters reserved apart from access. There is an update to the application where there is a point of clarification to reflect the potential impact on nitrates consistent with the main agenda report and the recommendation is amended as follows that subject to the submission of further information on the impact of nitrates at Fremantle farm site and with an appropriate assessment as necessary, the applicant be invited to enter into a legal agreement and then it is the same as the uh, main agenda report, so it's set out on, on this page. There is an uh, update as well, um, another letter of representation was received um, and the comments uh, are set out in the main, uh, in the update report and also within the main uh, um, committee report. There's nothing further to add. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, Mr. Wood, you have four minutes. Could I just uh, remind you, if I may, we have got uh, a list of your representation, which I understood you submitted. It is written out in the update report, and the officer's response to that is also covered on page seven of the uh, update report. So, uh, Presumably you have some more to say and material mm -hmm. considerations would be welcome. Thank you very much. You have four minutes. 
Thank you very much. So I, I haven't been provided with that update, so I haven't seen the officer's response on, on page seven. So please forgive me if there's some slight repetition. My points today are around the whether the enabling development requirements have been complied with. Um, in very brief order, the application made covers a listed barn and locally listed buildings. Locally listed buildings are specifically not covered by the guidance. And it appears that the, the application is effectively seeking public subsidy for items which are intentionally not covered by the Historic England Enabling Development Guidance. Therefore, the size of the development at Galley Lane is being artificially inflated by including items which ought not to be included. And um, the guidance does specifically exclude anything which is locally listed. The condition of the barn itself, it, it is at risk, but it is not, it's still in use today. There is no immediate threat. So there is nothing so severe that it can't be used. Uh, and therefore, there seems to be a lack of urgency to commit to anything while there are still some fundamental uncertainties. Uh, it's also not clear what has happened during the applicant's ownership that has caused it to deteriorate. Um, but it does, the guidance does state that enabling development should not be used to subsidise a business and it would look like all that's required to maintain this building and stop it decaying further is routine maintenance which would be part of normal business expenditure. Um, in relation to the numbers themselves, a, a quite staggering 25% contingency sum is being included for a project that the applicant has taken more than 10 years to plan and has detailed tenders of. So as someone with a financial background and understanding of property, the numbers simply do not stack up. They, they do point to inflating the size of the galley lane site required and therefore inflating the conservation deficit. The guidance does note that good practices for the applicant to pay for the council to have an independent surveyor audit the numbers. Uh, it appears that has not been done. Also, since the timing of the application, we have resolved the uncertainty due to Brexit. We have emerged or starting to emerge from COVID. All of that is pointing to a strengthening in the, the economy and uplift in local property values. Uh, and there's a belief that if the scheme was reassessed today, a smaller number of houses would be needed to put on that site to meet any conservation deficit. Um, there's also a question about public access. Um, the guidance does note that public access should be proportionate to the subsidy. I would say £700,000 is a very large number. But what we are looking at subsidising is a private property on private land access from a private road. There is no public benefit whatsoever. Uh, and I'm wondering what provisions are being made to give the public access to this building once it is restored. Um, in relation to an expert report, which was lodged over a year ago by a firm- You have just under one minute. Minutes. Thank you. Um, there were questions in that report a year ago where fundamentally an expert firm of uh, surveyors and planners said that based on the documents presented, there was no reasonable expectation that enabling development would be granted. Since then, there obviously have been various discussions with the applicant, but I've seen nothing in the documents so far that suggests that any of those fundamental points have been addressed. Um, fundamentally, I think the issue is that the amount of the enabling development is vastly in excess of the minimum necessary to meet a conservation deficit to maintain the historic England listed building. Um, and that's really the, cr the crux of my unresolved concern is that, that there are multiple areas where we have lack of clarity. I have no problem with enabling development, but it doesn't seem to stack up to scrutiny. And the size of the proposed development is simply too large to justify. Thank you very much, Mr. Wood. Now, Thank you. Uh, members, any questions for the speaker? Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Wood, in, early in your speaking, you mentioned you used the phrase public subsidy. Yes. Could you explain to me how you think the public are subsidising this when it's actually being funded by another private development? I don't understand how you think the public are subsidising it. Absolutely. The Historic England development is, uh, guidance is quite clear that 
any enabling development is to be regarded in a similar manner to a cash grant by a, a council. I appreciate that no cash is changing hands, but the guidance under which this is being sought specifically says that this is to be regarded in the same manner as a cash grant. Okay, I, I really don't understand that. I don't still don't see when the developer of the of, of this is putting the profit from the houses into another property that he owns. I, I, I don't understand how we think how anybody can think that that is public subsidy. Uh, the, the, the public subsidy comes from the fact that a, a piece of land, which is currently worth, for argument's sake, £10,000, will shortly be worth £710,000 through a decision made by the council under the enabling development guidance. So it is an act by the council to confer a vast sum of money to a private individual to in turn enhance a privately owned building that I think it is public subsidy and that's what the Historic England guidance classes as a public subsidy. Okay fine, Th thanks for your answers. Um, it's unfortunate Mr Wood that you had, didn't have access which is publicly available, the update papers are publicly av available on the website, they're issued in the afternoon of this committee meeting when those answers are answered that your questions are answered by the officers, which is why I've drew your attention to it. Uh, any more questions for the speaker? No, thank you very much indeed, Mr Wood. Thank you. Um, I'd like, um, at this point, I just want to make sure that agenda item number one and agenda item number two are the same uh, property at Fremantle Farm but one is the listing building consent and one is the application for the uh, enabling agreement. Um, now, um, Mr. Wood was speaking to item number one. Now we have a speaker, Mr. Marsden, who is down to speak for both the listed building consent and the uh, main application. Now, Mr. Marsden, are you there? I'm here, yes. You are entitled to speak to each of these. We're, we're going to take them together because one follows the other. We vote on them separately, uh, item number one, but uh, maybe you can wrap up both of your uh, comments for the application, including the list and building consent. Technically, you have a total of eight minutes because you're down to speak to both of them, but uh, maybe you can wrap it up a little bit quicker than that. And you now may begin, and I'll time you for an eight-minute session. Uh, thank you very much. Um, good evening. Um, thank you also for the opportunity to speak in support of the applications at Fremantle Farm and Galley Lane Headley. Um, the applicant has been working with Basingstoke and Dean for some years to try and find an acceptable and viable proposal for the protection of the listed and locally listed heritage assets at Fremantle Farm. The last formal submissions being just over two years ago, um, which some of you may remember. Um, following the grant of listed building consent but refusal of planning permission at committee in 2019, there's been significant and very productive engagement with officers and an extensive bank of technical information provided that addresses the reasons for refusal given at that point uh, and resulted in the current submission being registered at the beginning of last year. We're very pleased that as a testament to that engagement, we're offering these proposals to you for consideration alongside the recommendation for approval. Um, the submissions have been well described in the officer's report, but in very brief terms, the proposal involves the conservation of a listed barn funded in large part via the proposed sale of an enabling development site, um, enhancements to the setting of that listed barn and the conversion to residential use of a former stables building, a building of local interest at Fremantle Farm. It's important to note that the residential conversion and the future building maintenance for this, for this and the conversion um, the listed barn did not contribute to the conservation deficit figure set out and would not be funded by the enabling development. Following a comprehensive review of the land within the applicant's ownership and the grounds given for refusal of the 2019 application, the site at Galley Lane has been developed in further detail as the most appropriate available site for the enabling development element of this submission. Galley Lane site is closely related to the village of Headley, 
appropriately sized and presents positive opportunities for biodiversity and local ecological enhancements, as well as securing the delivery of new housing that would contribute towards the current local shortfall in supply. The location also presents a possibility that it can be brought forward as an outline submission, allowing for optimum flexibility in a changing market and future control of the final design solution under the auspices of the reserve matters application to the council. Detailed information is provided evidence the potential for delivery of a good mix of dwelling sizes and types, a safe and workable access supported by the local highways authority on consultation, and a form of development and ecological enhancement appropriate to the local area as part of a completion of a biodiversity di metric exercise. The quantum of enabling development proposed in the outline submission is based on a series of final market value assessments and is ultimately only driven by balancing the cost of the conservation deficit of Fremantle Farm. This conservation deficit figure includes the cost of work to the listed barn, its immediate setting, but not the adjacent buildings, associated professional fees and appropriate 10% contingency for working within an historic building and an allowance for finance costs. It doesn't include a 25% contingency. I, I believe that may have been misread as including contingency preliminaries and finance costs uh, in the previous speaker's representation. The cost and value information has been analyzed in detail and ratified by an independent third party surveyor under the instruction of the council and has been deemed to be clear and reasonable. If anything, the advice from that third party is that the balance of cost risk lies with the applicant. The residential conversion at Fremantle is to be retained and rented to avoid fragmentation of the farm site in line with historic England guidance. And the inclusion of this high quality conversion in the project is one element of trying to ensure the long-term future of the site as a whole when placed alongside the current rental of the original farmhouse. The final proposal was responded positively to planning policy and each of the statutory consultation responses received sits within Historic England's enabling development guidance for preservation of historic assets and presents, we believe, a well evidenced and thoughtful submission for which we hope members will resolve to grant approval. Thank you very much for your time. I think I'm substantially under eight minutes. Yes, just over four. And I thank you for that, Mr. Marsden. Thank you. Um, members. Any questions for the applicant? Again, uh, Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Marston, could you tell us what the the listed barn is likely to be used for after it's been after it's been restored? The intention for the barn is to revert to its sort of optimum viable use, uh, as described in the enabling development guidance. That, in this case because of the access to the barn being quite difficult for any modern, mar any modern farm machinery, would be low level storage for the large part with some ancillary to the residential that's created on the site in part of the floor, floor print of the barn. So it's, it's essentially a low level storage for agricultural purposes with some residential. Thank you very much. No other questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Marsden. Thank you. Uh, members, questions to officers, and if you wish any access to the visualizer on your screens, just ask. And we do have an officer available to throw the visualizer up for you, if should you show wish. Questions to officers. Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so just um, just for clarity in my mind, we're talking about the erection of seven uh, buildings for residential dwellings. Are we also looking at conversion of some of the farm buildings to dwellings? So how many dwellings are we going to have as a result of this application? Thank you, Councillor. Yes, yeah, so the proposal is for seven, an outline application for seven dwellings at the Galley Lane site, um, which is an outline, so all matters reserved apart from access, and then one dwelling, the conversion of one dwelling, which would remain within the control of the applicant, um, and the rental income from that conversion would fund the ongoing maintenance of the barn once the repairs had been carried out. And to secure that as part of the enabling development, it's all part of the section 106, which is set out in the update report that what we are trying to secure. Um, so the funds um, 
from the value of the enabling development would fund the completion of the enabling works to and the repairs to the listed barn. And then there would be a separate element where the barn, um, sorry, the stable building would remain in the ownership, all within one ownership, um, and the ongoing rental income would support an ongoing maintenance to the barn. So it's not, it, it secures a long-term uh, protection of, of that listed building and the heritage asset. Thank you. Any more questions to officers? Councillor George. Thank you, Chair. Um, very quickly, um, I'm very interested in this uh, the, the location of the enabling development. You know, it, it's, it's quite remote from Fremantle. I just wondered, is there any guidance or any anything there in planning law which suggests that the enabling development should be within proximity or, or close to, or is there any restrictions at all on where the enabling development should actually be, please? Thank you, Councillor. There is um, some guidance on avoiding fragmentation of um, of the enabling development itself. So, if if you had an asset um, and uh, the and you wanted to convert part of the site to residential and was then selling it off to fund the development, that fragmentation could adversely affect the ability um, for the enabling development to to be maintained long term. Um, the applicant originally, so the previous application, they looked within the Fremantle farm site at various options. Um, and while some of that enabling development was deemed acceptable at the previous committee meeting, the issue uh, was with the um, dwelling at Ash Lane uh, being on an elevated position within the AOMB. So they, they tried to keep it within the original sort of Fremantle farm um, land holding as it were um, however there is no nothing to stop them having a site uh, removed from the um, enabling development uh, or the heritage assets that requires the enabling development and in this instance the land whilst um, you know some distance away it is within the control and ownership of the the same person so yeah it is still covered and we are securing it with the section 106. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor Potter. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think a question to Lucy. I mean, I remember, I think, at least two site visits that we had back in the good old days when we could actually yes. get out and about. So I think we all know the site. Um, I just wanted to check. I mean, Mr Wood and his representations made the comment about the inevitable uplift in the site on which the seven units, the enabling development, would be built. And they were probably theoretical figures, but... Whatever that may be, the increase in land value, which is inevitable, is no concern of this committee. Am I right in saying that? Yes. Um, the uh, I'll just sort of set out what, what has happened. So um, obviously land values change over time. The application was made in 2000, uh, well, about a year ago. So um, the situation has changed beyond the applicant's control. They they had put together uh, an application for um, quantifying the amount of development that they required to cover the costs of the repairs to the listed barn. Um, the the figures that we or the commentary that we received back at, from the independent um, valuer was that actually the applicant was. Um, uh, has decreased the amount required for the repairs to the listed barn because they've now got more information on how much the works uh, are going to cost. They've got a different um, uh, developer or not developer, a builder on board, and they believe that the works to the roof of the building were previously, I think the total figure for the enabling works was just over a million pounds, one million fifty thousand, something like that, and that is now reduced down to seven hundred and um, I should have the figures in front of me. Um, sorry, seven hundred and eleven is it, or seven hundred and fourteen? Um, but so so the figures have the applicant has tried to sort of work and be as economical with the amount of development required to fund the enabling development works as they as they can be rather than the other way around. And actually the uh, valuer had stated that um, 
uh, the applicant is going to be paying out money as well. You know, it, it is not no. the other way around. I don't know if that answers the question exactly, but um, yeah. It does, it does, and um, I'm content with that. Thank you very much. All right, no more questions. I'm going to move then into debate. Who would like to kick this one off? Uh, Councillor Bound. Um, well, somebody's got to start as normal. So, uh, um, I, I'm um, quite positive about this um, application. Um, I was very pleased to see, for instance, that um, condition 30 uh, seems stronger than I've noticed in the past. And that's related mm. to um, the, same thing. Um, the, green, the green measures, if you like. I thought that was quite strong and very positive development. So I was very pleased to see that. Um, obviously, we're going to have uh, the conservation of a heritage asset, which is also a positive. And I remember from previous discussions on this site that we all wanted that to happen. It was just the way that it was going to happen that we were we, we were not we were not going to go along with. Basically, um, it's also going to increase the housing stock within the borough. Um, I I'm a little bit saddened, really, that. The affordable, it would have triggered affordable because it's above five in the countryside, I think. But because it's not, um, it, it would then make the, the scheme um, unviable. So I, I'm somewhat disappointed on, on that aspect. But on balance, I think that the, um, the fours, um, the four that the scheme sort of um, overcomes my objections that might have arisen um, in terms of the lack of affordable housing. And I'm a, bit, I'm a little bit disappointed that, you know, it's, you've got seven other houses being shoved into another ward um, um, without, without really the people there having too much say about it. However, I'll leave it the rest to debate. Fine. Any more for debate? Uh, Right, Councillor Potter, followed by Robinson and McCormick. Councillor Potter? Sorry, I did beg your pardon, Chair. Um, saying straight away, I think I'm content to support this application. I think there's a substantial amount of work being done by the officers in conjunction with the applicant, which moderates it from what we were looking at a couple of years ago. Um, I remember reminiscing again about our long trek up the lanes. And I mean, our biggest concern at the time was really the elevated position of the single unit that was being proposed at that time and the impact on the night sky and all the rest of it really. A lot of that has gone. And um, Councillor Ban makes the point. It's disappointing in one respect that the enabling development, the proposed seven dwellings are not closer to the origin of the application itself but nevertheless they are seven additional units which are necessary for the enabling development i think it's a lot and i'm content really certainly from what lucy was saying that the um, renovations that are being proposed are adequate for such a building and are going to be funded properly so that um, you know a decent renovation is going to be performed under this um, application and uh, I'm very happy to propose it for um, the support chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. I, I should probably have asked for this under when we were talking to officers, but um, we've talked a lot about the barn. What we haven't talked about is the is the galley lane development. Could the officers just rattle through the visualizer presentation for where where the galley lane um, development is and what we're looking at there? I think the layout at Galley Lane is probably. Yeah, would you like there. me? Yeah, uh, Jill, are you able to show the site layout? Thank you. That's it. Yeah, so um, uh, this is um, Galley Lane Farm House is adjacent to the site. There is a, um, 
a um, garage building and stables adjacent to the eastern boundary. There is a small cul-de-sac called Payne's Close on the opposite side of Galley Lane. Uh, the application is reserved, all matters are reserved apart from the access um, and the Highways Authority have confirmed they have no objections to the access um, and don't consider that it would generate um, any detrimental impact on the highway network. Um, appreciate it uh, that members of the public had other um, opinions on that. Um, the original application, um, is there another, uh, th this is an indicative site layout, um, but yeah, sorry, do you want to go back? There, there was an alternative um, layout also shown, which showed additional um, planting to the northern boundary because there is a woodland uh, just to the north of the site. Uh, the application would also involve the relocation of the front hedgerow to enable visibility displays uh, to be acceptable. Um, and following work with the biodiversity officer, they've actually come in uh, to show net gain. They're using a strip of land to the west of the application site. Um, letters of representation and commentary had been received about whether the eastern boundary, which is adjacent to uh, the neighboring Galley Lane farm uh, site could perhaps be strengthened. Um, I have discussed this with the applicant's agent uh, and given that it is illustrative the layout there might be the opportunity for some additional planting along the eastern boundary however the um, further land for mitigation for the biodiversity net gain could not all be secured on that eastern boundary because it would reduce the developable site area and then uh, the knock-on effect would be you couldn't get seven dwellings on and so it goes on from there but there is the opportunity for some additional planting along that eastern boundary if, if required, but it, there is already quite a strong hedgerow along that side. And on this side, there is going to be an extra, um, quite a wide landscaping strip to enable biodiversity net gain to be achieved. And that would also be secured as part of the section 106 agreement. Wonderful. Is there anything else you need? No, I, I no. think you, you Sorry, have I? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I've talked to you. <laughs> Talk you to death. Um, Apologies. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very happy with that. <laughs> Thank Lisa, you. I'm more than happy to second Councillor uh, Potter's recommendation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Councillor McCormick. Um, much of um, what I want to say has been said already. Um, it's uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see a, 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 you know a, a building of value like this barn being restored. Um, and uh, you know we can't comment obviously on the the, the new houses because that's um, reserved matters. But uh, I, I don't see any problem with the uh, the quantum of the development. It, it's commensurate with uh, similar um, developments that we've seen in rural areas going back over fifty years. Uh, so I'm quite happy to support. Thank you very much. Uh, now. I'm going to say this, as I said, there are two applications here. One is for the um, the application, oh, let's get numbers right, uh, 2000386 full application, which includes an outline application for the galley site as well. That will be followed by an LOEC um, determination. So this is for item number one on the agenda that's been proposed and seconded and I will go through the roll call. Councillor Miller. Um, yes. Could, could I just uh, say, can I, uh, I'm really sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier. Condition 19 um, on page 104. Uh, could we just, uh, it mentions the A30. It should be the ah. A339. Did we Apologies. all get that? Thank you. It's a road number alteration that's what will be uh, that will be included within this vote but uh, yes we did mention that earlier on is that perfectly clear right and this is uh councillor robinson or councillor leaks or councillor goodison Councillor Goodison. Four. Sorry. Thank you. Councillor George. Four. Councillor 
Councillor Frankham? Oh. Councillor Harvey? Oh. Councillor McCormack? Oh. Councillor Bound? Oh. Thank you. Councillor Potter? Yes. Oh. And Councillor Tomlin? Oh. Thank you very much, Brenny. 10 from the recommendation. Thank you. Now that's carried. Officers? Thank you, Chair. Just to confirm, this application has been recommended for approval subject to the submission of further information and the recommendation as set out in the update report. Thank you. Thank you. I move on to agenda item number two, which is the same site. This is 387. This is the listing, listed building consent. I'm happy to go through the procedure again in terms of questions to officers. Any debate? Do I have a proposer? Councillor Robinson? Yeah, I move the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Seconder? Councillor George. Thank you. It's moved and seconded for uh, the reasons for approval for the listed building consent on this uh, development. So I'll run through it again. Councillor Robinson. Four. Councillor Leakes. Four. Councillor Goodison. Four. Councillor George. Four. Councillor Prankham. Four. Councillor Harvey. Four. Councillor McCormack. Four. Councillor Bound. Four. Councillor Potter. Four. And Councillor Tomlin. Four. Bernie. Ten for the recommendation. Thank you, officers. You're muted. Apologies. Lucy. Apologies. <laughs> they had, you're the first one tonight. It's all right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that application is duly approved, um, subject to the conditions and informatives listed at the end of the report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Move on to item number three. Now, this is another double. We've got three of them tonight. And um, could I ask Margaret Oram to check in, please? And if you'd just like to hold tight while the officers introduce the application. Thank you, Chairman. This application is for the site of Quidhampton Farmhouse, Station Road, Oakley, and seeks planning permission for the conversion of a former stable building, which is currently used as a log store, to provide an ancillary accommodation to be used in association with the main farmhouse. Members are referred to the update paper, which summarises further information received to the application and further correspondence from the applicant. The case officer has responded to this additional information. Notwithstanding the information received, there's been no change to the recommendation before the committee this evening. The application is recommended for refusal as set out within the agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Oram, uh, you have four minutes. Uh, is this for both um, matters? Uh, are you... Sorry, I'm just checking you down for both. Yes, you have eight minutes if you, you want to cover the both of them. Okay, thank you. When applying for alterations in a list of building application, the, the advice is better to ask before, which the applicants have done in the pre-planning consultation. The house and chapel at Quidhampton were listed on the 10th of January, 1953. Even though the barn stroke log store is within the curtilage of the listing, listings, Neither listing mentions the barn, which the applicants now wish to upgrade. This application is for Quidhampton Farm House and not Quidhampton Farm. Therefore, it is not the centre of the farm, but a domestic setting. I have visited the property and it does require renovation. The structural engineer has stated it is at risk. There are cracks in the walls, some patching up of the exterior walls and the timbers inside are rotten. It would be better if the barn was renovated and maintained. Quidhampton House has not been used as a farm for about 25 years and being only seven acres, it would not be viable as a working farm. The OPC, sorry, the Overton Parish Council considered the proposal 
proposed conversion as a well-designed and presented restoration for a building that was currently in a rundown state. A suggestion that no windows go in the west side of the property means the first floor bedrooms would have no ventilation and light, which would be unacceptable. The windows would only overlook the orchard and are in line with the windows below. Fenestrations were permitted when the chapel was renovated in 2016. Surely it's better for the barn to be upgraded for present day, present day purposes and maintained rather than left to deteriorate. It is a fairly quiet location and is a popular area for walkers and in the summer families paddle in the nearby river. At the Overton Parish Council meeting it was suggested that there would be no objection if this was used as a holiday cottage, although I understand it is intended that an elderly relative lives there. Environmentally, it must be better to re renovate an existing builder than to construct a brand new one. Overton Parish Council actively support this application. Thank you. Thank you very much and well within time. Uh, members, any questions to the Parish Council? No questions. Thank you very much, Margaret. Uh, could I ask Mr. Foote to come forward, please? Uh, Mr. Foote, you're the same. You're down for both uh, the main application and the uh, uh, listed building consent. So you have eight minutes starting now. Uh, good evening, Chair, and thank you um, for inviting me to speak across these, um, these two applications. Um, I am the applicant, and I've been, my interest is that I've been resident in Quidhampton Farmhouse for just over 26 years, which is the date from which the farming activity ceased on, on, this, on this site. <clears throat> um, in the middle of last year, we went through, in line with Historic England's um, recommendations, we went through a pre-planning consultation, and we agreed a set of principles for the renovation of this redundant building. These included swinging the access round to the west and installing bedrooms on the west elevation in line with what um, Councillor Oram has just said. My second point is that much has been said and made of, of Quidhampton Farm. Quidhampton Farm is a business that moved out of this site some 26 years ago when we moved in. And since then, no farming activity of Quidhampton Farm has taken place here at all. It has been used entirely for residential um, use. We believe this perception, this erroneous perception persists that Quidhampton Farm is still active in Quidhampton Farmhouse and evidenced by the fact that the reports that were submitted um, by, the, by, the, um, by the officers included three um, historic applications dating back 15 to 20 years that related to barns and sheds for Quidhampton Farm that are nowhere near Quidhampton um, Farmhouse. The particular, um, the particular site where this is looks out over a domestic orchard, which was an old concrete um, hard standing used for storing largely redundant farm equipment. This was not the farmyard, it was not the farmstead, even back in 26 years, years ago. Um, and this was altered in 1995 um, when we moved in, and um, that was helped by um, a grant from the council to help us to, to plant that domestic orchard. Um, just to get the thing into perspective, the, the objections that we have seen around this, um, this development are about and limited to the first floor windows on the, on the west side. Um, and, and that's what's coming in um, about, about the building. And it's over fenestration, which is close to the listed, the listed monument. And I'll come on to that one in a moment. And it is only because of the proximity to the listed monument that this curtilage is listed at all. There is nothing special about the building it's itself. And I think I would want to stress that we are not increasing the size of the building nor the overall look or feel of it at any stage whatsoever. I turn to the um, listed monument. This is the grade two star listed um, chapel. I believe it's the sixth oldest building in Hampshire. 
um, and it is um, and it's registered in the Doomsday Book in Pevsna and so on and so forth. We renovated this five years ago, and in the course of that renovation, um, we included no less than six new sets of fenestration in the north, the south, and the east elevations. Some of those were, were, were taking the place of ancient doorways, for, for sake of argument, which was bricked up perhaps by the Victorians, but others were brand new openings that were, that were supported throughout by these amino societies, by the listed, um, um, listed conservation officers, and were seen at the time and since has been a tremendous improvement to, um, to, what's, what's, to this part of, of, of Overton. I have in front of me a structural engineer's report, um, and I quote, this building is at risk. The first floor is dangerous and close to collapse. If this happens, it will take the walls with it. The crack in the south corner needs to be addressed before it fails. My final point then comes on to the renovation of, of the renovation, if a renovation was carried out without windows on the, on the first floor. Firstly, that would diametrically contradict the, um, the principles that were agreed in the pre-planning consultation back in, in, in the summer. And it would also represent an uneconomic purpose for this building. Now, whilst I understand on the one hand, um, economics or otherwise of listed building um, and listed heritage curtilage is not relevant. The, um, the clear guidelines on the Basingstoke and Dean website about, um, about maintaining build, buildings at risk is all about fi finding purpose for, for those buildings and finding reasons why they should be main maintained. If we don't have windows on this floor, then we don't have any windows on the, on the, foot, on the north side for obvious reasons. We don't have on the, any on the south side. We don't have any on the west side. It simply is not, it is not worth doing. And the only alternative would be to leave um, lights burning in the place all, at all times, which feels to be a completely unnecessary production of carbon dioxide in the time when we're all trying to reduce. Thank you, Chairman. Right. Uh, members, question to the applicant. Councillor George. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Ford. Um, very quickly, um, I, I, I've been, been listening with interest about this chapel. I, I've looked at all the plans, but I can't exactly see exactly where it is. I, is it the building that's on the, the north end of the sort of stable box at a slight angle? Is, 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 is that the one there? You can see it on one or two of the photographs, but it's not completely evident. There's a first question. And secondly, could I ask what, what that building is currently used for? Thank you. Um, yes, so um, your uh, Chairman Councillor George, um, you are absolutely right that it is the one at the northern end of, of, that, of that block. Um, it's the one that you can see which has got a semi-rounded window at the top of it. Yeah. And that semi-rounded window is put into one of the openings where a door used to be. The door height has changed many times over the last three, th uh, sorry, thousand years or so. Um, that, bu that building is now used as a studio. Thank you. Any more questions? No, thank you very much, Mr. Foote. Thank you. Councillor Tilbury. Good evening, Ian. Oh, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. You've right. got eight right. minutes. You're uh, down for talking on both the main application and the listed building consent. Oh, don't worry. I won't be talking for, for eight minutes. I mean, I won't add much to the previous speakers. As you know, there are no objections to this from anyone. Myself, Councillor Fillimore, who can't be here tonight, all, are all supportive of it. I mean, the conservation officer appears to be of the view that windows are acceptable on the western elevation. Although this isn't clear in the reasons for refusal, which just say there will be substantial harm to the um, listed building. So if some windows are acceptable, then you know, at what point do they become unacceptable? I think this is the issue. It's a question of degree, not 
you know, if they were saying no windows are acceptable on that side because of the impact on the Saxon Chapel, because that's what this is all about. It's the listed building, the Saxon Chapel. But if you look at the Saxon Chapel, you'll have seen the photographs of it earlier. That was, again, it was renovated about four years ago. It's got a lovely slate roof on it. Well, it would have had a slate roof in Saxon times. It would have been thatched, wouldn't it? So it's not original. It's been modified over many years. It survived because it had a use. Otherwise, they'd have just knocked it down 900 years ago, wouldn't they? But they knocked most of the other Saxon buildings down in the village. Uh, I, I think this is the problem. We're sort of struggling with this. Why, you know, why are the conservation officer making such an issue with this? You know, it's not like he's, he's proposing to knock the chapel down. It's going to do something next to it, which will, yes, it will look different. It may look more residential, but, you know, it's, as Mr. Foote said, it's not a farm. It hasn't been a farm for a long time. The farmer built himself a nice new farm up on the hill. And so he's, he's gone away. It's not used as a farm. It sort of looks like a bit of a farm and it'll still look like a bit of a farm now. But, you know, the, these buildings have to have a purpose. Otherwise, they won't last in the longer term, you know. I mean, you've obviously, you know, I was listening to the previous application with some interest there. I think the, the applicant here has missed a bit of a trick, and he should have proposed to build some houses there and got some, uh, got some, um, well, got the work done for free, effectively, wouldn't he? But I mean, there is a wider point with this as well. This is the second time in recent months the parish and myself and the ward councillors have had to come along to support applications where the conservation officers are sort of being a bit, bit oh, you know, I mean, we can see the, the sort of arguments are putting forward, but they're just not of any great interest to the people who live in this village. And yet at the same time, we're having to fight massive developments which are totally destroying the village. And no one seems to care about that at the council. And this is, you know, it does seem a bit odd. It's almost like there's some sort of penance to allow for the fact that we're going to, you know, build a few thousand houses in the village over the next few years. So. You know, we, we don't really have a problem with this. It will make some use. It will, you know, in the shorter term, it can be used to host the applicant's um, mother-in-law, which is a good thing. You know, we, we're we trying to, you know, it will create something of some use. I think that's the important point with this. And the fact that it may have an impact on the Saxon chapel, that's hardly Saxon at all. I suspect it's a bit like Trigger's broom. You know, it's had, God knows how many new bits in there. The only bit I think that's really of any, is, is the, the round window you can see there. But again, if you look at it now, it looks almost like a nearly new building. It's got a lovely new slate roof on it. Well, it's not particularly original, is it? It's, uh, you know, it's, and I think that's the trouble with these things. It's, we're not talking about some great historic building. It's a tiny little chapel, you know. <laughs> I don't think there's much more I can say, really. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Councillor Tilbury. Any questions for the ward councillor? No. Uh, see how efficient you are, Councillor Tilbury. Uh, thank you very much. Right, questions to officers. No questions to officers. Right, debate. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Um, just picking up on some of the arguments that we've heard, on page 149, and in fact, it's relevant to both of the applications, we see that the argument is that the Council for British Archaeology and the Ancient Monument Society do not object to the principle of the conversion to domestic use. End of story. What is, is there's detail associated with that. And I think the argument is correct, that if it isn't going to be converted to domestic use and there is no objection to it being converted into domestic use, then for it has to be a form of domestic use that is possible, that is acceptable, that does the job. And so therein, windows and elements need to be. And so because of that, I think it is a matter of degree. I look down the rest of the arguments on this page in particular, and it becomes a matter of windows and doors. And for me, I think it's perfectly acceptable. I appreciate what the officers are saying. Uh, and I understand the argument they're making in terms of where we must evaluate harm. I don't come down on that side of the debate. I don't think this is harmful in that way. And I would propose that it is approved. And I oppose that it doesn't do the things that the officer suggests it does in the reasons for rejection. So my reasons for approval are is that it is appropriate. It is bringing a dwelling, uh, a building back into a dwelling use that was appropriate. And I think EM 11 of the local plan is appropriate in that regard. But I would take guidance from officers if there are other particular policies they would point us to. But I'm 
pretty comfortable with it, to be honest. Thanks very much. We'll get there in a minute. Councillor Robinson, followed by Councillor Tomlin. Hey, uh, I'm more than happy to second the recommendation. I think the Council biggest risk to this building or any building like this is lack of use rather than use. Uh, you know, if something useful isn't done with it, we're going to finish up with a building that's in the same condition as the one in the last application, and we'll need a permitted development um, application to go with it. So let's save it now whilst we can. So I'm more than happy to second the recommendation um, as outlined by Councillor Harvey. Thank you. Right, Councillor Tomlin. Well, yeah, Nick, uh, Councillor Robinson uh, beat me to that. Um, yeah, it's just like a classic car. If you've got it, use it. If you've got a classic house, use it. Don't let it go down to waste. So, yeah, fully support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Officers, um, can we come back to the proposal? Um, maybe I'm speaking on behalf of Councillor Harvey now. And uh, he, what he's done is has turned the refusal on its head, basically, with EM11. Uh, would you like to make sure we've got this right? Okay, looking at the reasons for approval, sorry, reasons for refusal on page 140 of the agenda and then turning those around, then yes, you would be justifying your approach against the policy and against the development plan, which I think everything is probably covered in those two reasons. Again, if we flip them over, what I would just highlight to members is that if you were looking to um, recommend for approval, then we would also need to consider the addition of um, appropriate conditions. And I can provide a list of those and together with informatives. Thank you. I'd be happy thank to for the conditions, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Harvey, on that. And thank you, Catherine. Um, now, I'm addressing this first of all to item number three, which is the full application will address the uh, list of building control, uh, list of building consent uh, in a minute. So this is um, proposed and seconded for agenda item number three, which is 20026824. Okay. And the recommendation is for approval along the lines that have just been discussed. Councillor Robinson. Four. Councillor Leakes. Four. Councillor Goodison. Four. Councillor George. Four. Councillor Frankham. Four. Councillor Harvey. Four. Councillor McCormick. Four. Councillor Bound. Four. Thank you. And Councillor Tomlin. Four. Oh, sorry, Councillor Potter. Oh, oh. <laughs> I went down the list too quickly, I'm sorry. Sorry, if you need my vote, it's four. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Uh, before we go to Bernie, or well, Bernie, let's have the count and then we'll go to officers. And for the recommendation. Thank you very much for approval. Right, Catherine. Um, now we come on to conditions, informatives, and what goes along with that motion yeah. that's been carried. So just to confirm that the reasons for approval would be the reverse of the reasons for refusal that were set out in the agenda, having regard to the policy context of the um, MPPF and the local plan. With regards to conditions, I would be suggesting that we in, impose conditions to ensure accordance with the approved plans, a time limit of three years for the implementation of the permission, for the submission and approval of all the joinery details for new windows and doors, details of external lighting to be submitted and approved, all materials and finishes to be submitted and approved, details of other fixtures to be submitted and approved, so such as uh, drainage pipework flues, extract vents or any meter boxes, that the accommodation is conditioned to be ancillary in its use to the main house only, that we have details of hard and soft landscaping and boundary treatments submitted for approval, details of parking and turning on site, details of refuge and recycling storage and collection, and details of how water efficiency would be achieved within the building. It would all be suggested that um, we also add some advisory informatives. So that would be 
drawing reference to those within the agenda already, which refer to compliance um, with the MPPF. We'd also look at additional informatives to ensure compliance with any conditions, provide advice on the timing of works to avoid any harm to a protected species, to seek approval from Hampshire Highways if necessary for the reinstatement of the access from the highway, and uh, to provide advice on any new postal address. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Harvey, you content? And Councillor Robinson. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right, move on to item number four, the list of building consent for this same development. And um, I will, uh, I didn't have any questions for officers unless somebody else wants to ask it. Bear in mind the circumstances now changed. No. Do I have a proposer for this? Councillor George, Councillor Potter. Councillor George for proposing, Councillor Potter for seconding. Now, Councillor George, before we go anywhere, the reason for refusal is listed on page 160. And I would ask officers to give me a hand here, Catherine. And it's just, uh, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, Councillor George, but uh, may I suggest along the similar lines of the previous recommendation I, I totally agree chair i think it's just a reversal of the uh, the, re the one reason for the refusal is so. catherine is that acceptable to officers that we turn that around again we're back into em11 it would not cause harm to the significance of this cartilage building etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah, subject to the appropriate wording so twisting that around Again, yes. the reason for approval would be in accordance with the development plan and national planning policy framework. So, yes, it would be policy justified in that event. And again, I was also advised that if members were minded to um, approve the application, then again, it would need to be um, subject to appropriate conditions and informatives. Now, the conditions would be slightly different in this particular case, would they not? That is correct. I can outline some suggested conditions now, if that would be appropriate to you. Chairman. Yes, please, because I think that makes it a bit clearer. <laughs> Okay, so it would be suggested that any conditions attached to a list of building consent, again, would be seeking um, the development to be carried out in accordance with the approved plans. We would also have the appropriate time limit on the implementation of this building consent. Again, we would want those joinery details for the new windows and doors to be submitted and approved, and again, with the external lighting. But also, again, look for full details of all the works of the structural reinforcement of the of the building and its relationship with the retained fabric all those kind of details to be submitted and approved and again likewise with materials and finishes again there would also be the informatives so we're looking to ensure accordance with the uh, uh, with the planning conditions to provide advice on the timing of any works relating to protected species and again to seek approval from Hampshire Highways should there be the reinstatement of the access from the highway and of course again the informatives are set out within the agenda thank you fine thank you very much for that uh councillor george are you content with those conditions very content thank you chair right and councillor potter thank you as the seconder thank you so it's been moved properly proposed and seconded for approval of the listed building consent 02683 along with the conditions that have just been briefed by the officer so that's the motion for recommendation for approval. Councillor Robinson. Oh. Councillor Leakes. Oh. Councillor Goodison. Oh. Councillor George. Oh. And Councillor Frankham. Oh. Councillor Harvey. Oh. Councillor McCormick. Oh. Councillor Bound. Oh. Councillor Potter. Oh. And Councillor Tomlin. Four. Oh. Thank you, members, very much. Move on to item number five. Sorry, uh, Chairman, can now, I just come back in there? Oh, uh, beg your sorry. pardon. To confirm the vote, that was 10. Sorry, sorry, ahead of myself. Bernie. Yeah, <laughs> You're muted, Bernie. Sorry, 10 for the recommendation. Thank you. Sorry about that. Catherine. Thank you, Chairman. Just confirm that that application has been approved as per the adjust, um, the reason for refusal being reversed and the conditions as highlighted earlier to you with the informatives as well. Many thanks. Well, thank you. 
Uh, right, item number five on the agenda is uh, Hillside Farm. Now, this is the removal of conditions and I have no speakers to this, I believe. Yeah, no, there's no speakers on this one, Councillor. So if you'd like to introduce the application, please, Lucy. Thank you. This application was considered by Development Control Committee at its meeting on the 13th of January this year. Um, at the meeting, committee resolved to defer the application to secure further clarification from environmental health that appropriate standards were used for the completion of the submitted contaminated land intrusive investigation um, and that there was no need for further information required by Condition 7 of 1902178, which was an application that was approved back in September last year for land raising and landscaping works for the creation of a horse grazing area, which was part retrospective. Um, the application um, has been brought back to committee because comments from environmental health have now been received, uh, who confirmed that subject to condition eight, which is in uh, appended at Appendix A of this report that there are no objections to the removal of condition six and seven of that uh, approved application. Nothing further to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have no speakers, so this is questions to officers. Councillor Tomlin, followed by Councillor George. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> just a question really on condition eight. Um, it's the classic one, really. This puts the trust on the applicant. Um, or, uh, I mean, how do we, how do we, you know, actually monitor this? I mean, this is sort of a, a slightly difficult one. We have to take them at trust, or is there a mechanism that uh, can kick in that uh, someone somewhere has to flag that this material is trying to be disposed of and, and hasn't been done? Is it, can you just help me on that one, please? Thank you. The, as with most planning conditions, it does rely on the applicant to, um, to uh, comply with the conditions that are set out. Um, and quite often we get uh, referred to um, of any breaches of planning conditions and, and we are notified if, if um, works uh, are undertaken that, that shouldn't be. Um, but it is the case that, yes, we rely on um, the applicants to to comply with those conditions. I would say that given the works that were undertaken as part of um, condition six, the information provided, environment and health are, you know, are satisfied that the development as proposed is acceptable and they have raised no objection to this subject to that condition eight. So, um, you know, that is the, the evidence that we needed to, to then bring the application back to committee with the, with the re recommendation as it is. Okay, right, thank you. Councillor George, followed by Councillor Potter. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, looking at this one, uh, I think, uh, as, uh, as the officer just mentioned there, the, the reason this went back was confirmation that, uh, um, that uh, basically condition six had been complied with and uh, condition seven as well so they could be removed um, and the condition eight would would replace them um, uh, there's there's a fundamental issue with I think uh, condition six and seven if you look at the reasons for those conditions it clearly states that impact on groundwater is a key consideration of those particular conditions if you look underneath them all there um, and um, I think uh, from discussions with environmental health, um, there seems to be a little bit of a, a lack of, 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 should we say, confirmation that, uh, that fundamentally consideration has been given to groundwater on, on these assessments. In other words, I think uh, clearly environmental health has come back and said, yes, there'll be no impact on the grazing animals on the site, but I'm, I'm unable to get from environmental health um, any confirmation that they really considered the groundwater aspects. Now, it is possible that the Environment Agency have looked at that, but 
have we, could I ask a more question, have we actually got information or confirmation from the Environment Agency that they have considered the impacts on groundwater and that we can be clear about that and that has been done? Because otherwise, the, certainly the work that has been done uh, doesn't really address groundwater impacts at all. All it purely looks at is when animals graze on the land eventually, will, will, they, will they get poisoned, basically? I might ask Mike to step in on this one, but um, obviously the com I, I don't know what exactly the conversation that you had with the environmental health team was. Um, I all I have is the um, the response from them that they don't raise any objections to the conditions as amended, and that is the basis at which this application is brought back to committee. But Mike, have you got anything further to add? Chair, yeah, may I come in? Certainly. Uh, yeah, so I think um, I, I, I think the the original condition um, six, as you say, Councillor, did reference to uh, controlled waters in, in the reason. So um, I think reasonably our, our our assumption would be that when environmental health had looked at it, that they were satisfied, not necessarily that the, the controlled waters had been, been fully addressed, but they were satisfied that the uh, potential contaminants that, that had been identified had been um, Done so appropriately, uh, and that no further information was required at this at this stage to fulfil the overall requirements of that condition. So it's that preliminary work, and then the um, uh, the sort of working through that condition six. So I, I can't add anything further to that chair in terms of specifics for this evening's meeting, um, other than to reiterate what really what Lucy's already described, which is that you know environmental health looked at this for a second time. Um, following the deferral of the last application, um, and had deemed that in, in their comments on the application that they were satisfied that it was it was it was discharged. I think that the, the safety net, if you like, if you want to describe it that way, is 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 really in relation to condition eight uh, in, in trying to to resolve that. I understand Councillor George's point is on a slightly different point around controlled waters, um, but as I understand it, that wasn't part of the EA's um, concern on on the original application. Yeah, I'm afraid I won't be able to add anything more in terms of detail on that because obviously it's getting into the technicalities of specifically uh, what environmental health have, 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 have looked at. Uh, right, thank you, Mike. Uh, Councillor George? Yes, uh, thank you very much indeed there for that. But can I um, uh, you know, address that, I think? Um, certainly, um, you know, It'd be very nice to know whether the Environment Agency have actually addressed the groundwater problem, but my understanding is that nobody's gone back to the Environment Agency to actually uh, obtain the information. That's my understanding, but I may be wrong and I'd like you to confirm that or not. And secondly, as I, I said, if you certainly if you if you read the documents, uh, the report, it, it doesn't really address groundwater at all. All it says is, in fact, if uh, if you look at the sampling there's uh, four there's four little trenches of a, of a meter depth and there's some samples taken from that and and they say because we haven't found any contamination there we 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 don't think there's going to be any impact on groundwater well you know really that is totally inadequate and certainly from uh, i would certainly question whether it it actually meets the requirements of the british standard that's quoted there it's uh, it's certainly not a comprehensive assessment of the of the risks of the contamination on this site so could I, could I have your views on that, please? Yes, go ahead, Mike. Uh, yeah, yeah, so um, uh, on the specific point about whether the environment agency have been consulted, I don't know. Uh, I would suspect not in relation to a discharge condition element with regards to um, environmental health consideration of that. Um, Lucy may have more up-to-date information. Yes, go ahead, Lucy. You're muted again. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, just to say, um, the case officer did try uh, numerous times during the course of the application to get a response from the Environment Agency and Hampshire County Council as Waste and Minerals Authority because there were various ongoing um, dialogue between whether this was a waste application or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's been quite a, a long-standing um, issue, but neither party made comments on the application. So. Uh, they they did not want to. Well, I can't say they didn't want to, but they did not comment on on the application. 
Okay, Councillor George. Okay, thank you for that. Yes. Right, Councillor Potter. Thank you, Chair. I mean, I defer to the um, better knowledge of Councillor George in this regard. He's covered the point I was going to try and raise, not as well, but I did just want to check with the officers. I mean, the Environmental Health Officer makes a point in, I think, in his or her commentary that there should be a watching brief maintained mm. in the event then. I mean, with respect, to what does that mean? Um, you know, in terms of our very limited resources, I think we've been here before, haven't we, really, um, on this matter and discussions around it. Um, what does watching brief really mean? Is this regular inspections or is it at the instigation of the applicant themselves? Because as Lucy said, a lot of this is built on trust, isn't it? Um, and if, I don't want to be too cynical on this, really, but I mean, clearly we're not going to have Back in the old days, in terms of building control officers and the like, we're not going to have somebody actually physically inspecting this on a regular basis, are we? So what do you think watching brief means there? Yeah, if I, if I may answer that one, I, I think the, um, the watching brief reference is, is, is really just making the point that the environmental health officers are saying that they're satisfied of the information they've had so far, but they're not discounting the possibility, at least I suppose, of, of, being, of further contamination being encountered later on. And I think the watching brief really is, is why condition eight then becomes relevant. So it's effectively, um, I suppose, put it another way, put, put, put it, putting the applicant on notice that they need to maintain that watching brief. So it is applicant reliant again, um, but under the guise of the, of the planning condition. And that then if they do encounter that, the, the, the requirements of condition eight then, then kick in. So I think that's the context in which watching brief has been referenced by the Environment Health Officer. Okay, Chair, I understand it better. Thank you. Um, thank you. Right, I've got a quick one directly related to that, Mike. Is Do I take it from what you just said that the Condition 8 never expires? Um, certainly during the uh, lifetime of the, of the, the actual development works, yes. Uh, so that I think that, that, that's, that's the intention of... of, of with condition eight, that effectively it's um, you know, as I said, when, when should anything be found, uh, which would be naturally during that the, the process of the development itself, uh, then they'd be contacted immediately, uh, and and effectively a, that's when a, a scheme of works to to investigate further in in that event. I I would suggest that that would be during that, that construction or, or development phase, because I believe this is. Uh, they had to put a lot of topsoil onto this site, if my memory serves, because it's been before the committee twice, I think. Um, there was uh, soil put on the top of what was a, another infill. And I think the point that was being made by Councillor George was they've only gone down a metre, but the, the elevation, this thing's been raised up way more than a metre. And I think the concern is what's underneath it? Uh, and that's only going to be coming out if it leaches out uh, over a period of time. I think that's, I, I'm not trying to, that's my viewpoint, uh, certainly, because I know we were very concerned within the committee about this whole topic. Yeah, I, I, I think it could just come down to the, to the ability of conditions to deal with that scenario. I, I don't think there's a condition that can be Ongoing, if you like, in, in, in terms of how, how it would then be uh, reported, I, I think it is intended for the for the construction phase or, or the development phase. Um, and if there was further development, i.e. something that went beyond this application, then that would be something that we'd need to capture in conditions on that. Um, again, Lucy may, may, may know more from, from the discussions on the Environment Health Officer, but that's certainly my reading of, of the condition as drafted. Okay, thank you. Lucy, have you got anything to add or not? Sorry, yeah, no, nothing further to add on that. Okay, thank you. Any more questions to officers? Debate. Councillor George. Thank you, Chair. Um, having gone through this, and as I mentioned, I did have uh, some discussions with the Environmental Health Office on these issues. It's becoming very clear to me that unless the environment agency have done a risk assessment themselves, the groundwater impacts assessment side has not really been addressed at all. So 
if we're looking at conditions six and seven, is specifically relating to groundwater risks, and they, they haven't been covered, frankly. They really haven't. So if you're asking, have, is it possible to discharge those, certainly based upon the reports that are in the, you know, publicly available, um, they, they haven't really touched on those at all. There's been no detailed examination, no groundwater samples taken, and no really samples taken below a metre depth. So that's, um, you know, I, I, I don't think or my opinion certainly would be that certainly the British standard has not been complied with because that requires all pathways to be looked at. And, and I don't think that, as I say, the groundwater aspects of six and seven have. Now, the question is, is that mute because eight could take over? Well, the answer is you wouldn't find groundwater contamination unless it turned up in the local streams and brooks and everything else for a long time. So, and, and also eight is interesting. It, it suggests that if you find fill, substantial made ground that, that in kicking well the whole site is made ground virtually nearly all of it you know it's been imported material so I'm not even sure you know how that's going to be implemented at all so I've got some significant issues on this unless we can get um, confirmation from the environment agency that that their investigations because clearly they must have done some work at the early stages because they're requiring 314 cubic meters to be taken away from site. They're clearly basing that on something. Unless we can get access to that information and, and clear ourselves that there are no groundwater impacts, I, I don't think six and seven have been um, complied with, and I don't think eight's going to help at all. Thank you for that, Councillor Tomlin. Well, that was um, thank you, uh, Chair. That that from Councillor George was. Um, a fairly damning um, summary of what we know we don't know. And um, I'm afraid condition eight, yes, I know that's all we have, but we don't have, I think, the resource, or should we in these circumstances trust an applicant with such a, a, a thing? It's a difficult one. So I don't know that uh, condition eight is really uh, achievable uh, in such a case as to say, well, let's put eight in and, and like we're saying, take six and seven away. So, uh, yeah, I'm not, not, not content until we actually, well, it sounds like, get the EA to uh, come out of their shell and answer some questions. So that's uh, my comment at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more comment? Mike. Yeah, I appreciate I'm not a member, so I'm just coming in to... For, no, advice. I'll so, take your I'll take your advice. Not not part of, 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 the, of the debate session, but it, it, it was it was just hopefully to 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 try and assist and move move on and just pick up on Councillor Tomlin's last point there about the 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 um, uh, commentary from the EA. It has been known in the past year that um, bear in mind this application has been deferred once before. Um, it has been um, uh, resolved or, or resolutions have been put forward that have been subject to receipt of satisfactory um, response from the environment agency. I mean, the, the, the resolution could be captured in that way that effectively um, the application um, be approved subject to the environment agency responding on the specifics in relation to impact on groundwater. And obviously that would have to be a positive response that they are satisfied with what has been submitted. Um, if, if, that, if that response comes back, then the application can be approved and the delegated authority through the resolution. If it comes back saying, actually, no, we're not satisfied um, or, or, or in the alternative, it doesn't come back at all, um, then, then it comes back to committee in, in due course. That may be a, a possible way forward, Chair. Thank you for that, Mike. Councillor George. Thank you, Chair. I, you know, that's a, a reasonably good suggestion, I think, from Mike. The only thing I would say is that I think it'd be necessary for the Environment Agency not only to show there's no objection, but, but also to demonstrate that actually investigations have been taken place and that they can demonstrate that there is no impact, because otherwise we're I'm, I'm concerned for this council in a lot of ways that if we can't demonstrate this and some problems occur in the future um, by removing these conditions, we I don't know where that leaves us, frankly. Okay, it looks like we're getting there. Councillor Tomlin. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think that that, that with the caveat from uh, Councillor George would, would be a way forward because it's really that is exactly what we're after. We want we want some further yeah. input from the regulatory authority and, and with respect uh, it wouldn't discharge our condition as it, you know, our responsibility, but it would go a long way to uh, making us credible, giving giving permission. Thank you. Yeah, I I agree with that. Right. Thank you, uh, Mike. Yeah, yeah. In which case, could I suggest a, a slightly slightly reworded version? Um, in in that the 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 delegation to to approve would be subject to the response coming back from the Environment Agency, obviously being positive that the groundwater risk assessment had been, been taken into account, either based on investigations or based on a clear commentary as to why investigations, further investigations were not required for them to come to that conclusion. Because I, I can, I, it may be a, a situation for, for reasons that we just simply don't know this evening as to why they are satisfied, but so long as they've made a, a positive comment either way, that, that would effectively allow the, the, the delegation for approval. But if, if that didn't come back or, or they came back with an objection, uh, they clearly would be coming back to committee. Chris, uh, Councillor Tomlin. Well, on that basis, Chair, I'd be happy to move recommendation then with, with that, that caveat that Mike has um, outlined. Okay, and a seconder? Well, uh, Councillor George, because he's uh, been quite a part of this. Are there any other comments from members? No, I'll take that. Um, now, how do we play this, Lucy? Don't you need to do the vote? Uh, yeah, but a vote. Oh, but are, are you have you captured that caveat? Yes. Yep. Um, Mike. Mike and I will. Yep. We will uh, get that sorted for for the minutes. Fine. And members, is everybody satisfied that we move this for approval based on that caveat and that, uh, that adjustment to the resolution? No. Do you, anybody want any further explanation? No. On that basis, I will call the vote. It's been properly moved and seconded for approval. <coughs> and Councillor Robinson? For. Councillor Leakes? For. Councillor Goodison? Four. Councillor George. Four. Councillor Frankham. Um, I'm going to have to abstain. I had to leave to answer the door to get some urgent medication. Thank you very much for that, Councillor. Councillor Harvey. Four. Councillor McCormack. Four. Four. Councillor Bound. Four. Councillor Potter. Four. And Councillor Tolling. Four. Bernie? I have nine, four, and one abstention. Thank you very much. Is there anything to add, officers? No, um, we will We will um, secure the recommendation as per Mike's commentary earlier. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, we move on to item six and seven got a lot of doubles tonight <laughs> but it means to move along uh there are no no speakers to this i'll let the officers introduce it then uh, we'll take it from there thank you chairman so this application addresses the property of Yew Tree Cottage in Hannington. Planning permission is sought for the installation of electrical vehicle charging unit to the front elevation of the property, along with the associated cabling, where these works do not qualify as permitted development due to the property being a Grade 2 listed building. The details of the works are set out on pages 209 and 210 of your agenda. There is no update for this application, which is recommended for permission. Many thanks. Thank you. Uh... Questions to officers? Anybody? A question to officers? Councillor George? Thank you, Chair. Um, if just one uh, small uh, question here. It's um, the cables seem to be going around the building, which is fine, and everything else, which is, which is uh, I think, but. 
I cannot see on plans or anything where exactly how high the cable is up up the wall. It says sort of at ground level, but is is it is it below, just below ground level, just on the junction, or is it some way up the wall? I, I I can't really see on the on the drawings exactly where that is. It's not very not very clear. Thank you, Councillor. I would confirm that it isn't clear on the actual drawings. I would refer you to the photographs on page 209 of your agenda, where it illustrates where the wall socket is to be and where the power cable is to go. And then on page 203 of your agenda, it is commented by the case officer that the location of the cabling running along the exterior wall at ground level. And therefore, in that case, it was considered to be um, acceptable in terms of the character and appearance of the property. You're muted, Councillor. i just come back at that because I think very quickly, if you look at the photograph showing the box of the cable coming out, it's, it's a couple of bricks up from the ground level. It looks that way to me, whereas you're saying it's actually at ground level. That's, that's the reason I asked the question, actually. I'm afraid I would be drawn by the, um, the commentary within the report as well as the, the photos where actually where you're looking at the photos it, along the front elevation and down the side, it does appear to be running along the ground. Obviously, I appreciate that is artistic um, impression there. Of course, the officer considering the application would have very carefully considered the positioning of the cable and had he felt it unacceptable, then of course that would have been picked up on within the recommendation before you. But I would say that in this particular instance, the positioning of the cable has been deemed acceptable and when you were referred to photos in the presentation, this isn't the only cabling on the property in any event. Thank you for that. I was looking at the, uh, the photograph on page 210, which shows the cable some, some distance up the wall. And I don't know whether that's the, that's presumably some other building, is that correct? Catherine? Uh, I'm very sorry, I missed that um, query there. If you could possibly repeat it for me, I, I do apologize. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I, I, I just mentioned, I was looking at the photograph on page 210 and uh, I'm assuming that is, is, is not a, is indicative of what's going on going at this building because that cable, as you say, is quite a few courses up the wall and uh, that purely that is used for showing the charging box rather than the position of the cable is that correct that's how i understand it yes thank you councillor robinson did you want uh, to ask a question no okay uh, is there any debate councillor harvey we've got to be honest here looking at page 210 and appreciating dave's commentary I wouldn't mind if it was that far up the wall, to be honest. It's almost leg height. It's about 11 bricks up the wall. It's not significantly high, really. Um, and I'd move the application because I think it's a good application. The more of this, the better. Uh, yes, it's only here because it's a listed building. Absolutely. These electrical sockets are permitted development in Absolutely. normal circumstances on the houses of most of us, I think. Yeah, uh, but even, list, even listed buildings need them, don't they? So they <laughs> even listed buildings need them. Yeah, in this day and age. Um, I'll second the motion. It's quite hap I'm quite happy to, from the chair. And I moved and seconded for approval. This is on both of the applications. This is on the listed building set. I have to take two votes. Uh, I'm committed to that, unfortunately. So this is for the application um, 03017 householders and run through the roll call. Ned Robinson? Four. <coughs> Councillor Leakes? Four. Councillor Goodison? Four. Councillor George? Four. Councillor Frankham? Four. Councillor Harvey? Four. Councillor McCormick? Four. Councillor Bound? Four. Councillor Potter? Four. Councillor Tomlin? Four. Next, we have to run past the listed building consent. Chair, that's 10 for the recommendation. 
Thank you, Bernie. I appreciate that. And this is a straightforward recommendation on this on the same property. And uh, I'll propose it from the chair. Do I have a seconder? I'm happy to. Oh, Councillor Leakes, thank you. So it's been moved and seconded for approval. Councillor Robinson? Or. Oh. Councillor Leakes? Or. Oh. Councillor Goodison? Or. Oh. George? Or. Oh. Councillor Frankham? Or. Oh. Councillor Harvey? Or. Oh. Councillor McCormick? Or. Oh. Councillor Bound? Or. Oh. Councillor Potter? Or. Oh. And Councillor Tomlin? Or. Oh. Bernie? And for the recommendation. Thank you, officers. Thank you, Chairman. I can confirm that the application for planning permission has been approved as per the agenda. And likewise, the application for listed, uh, listed building consent has also been approved as per your agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Move on to item number seven, Grantham House and Crawley House. And could I ask Miss Licorice to check in, please? Hello, good evening. Good evening. If you just sit tight, the officers will introduce the application. Thank you. Thank you. Just to say there is an update to this application, uh, agenda page 217 um, and the update. Uh, the application is for the retention of access gates and fen fence wings, which is a retrospective application. Um, you may, well, you will be aware of this site. It has been to committee several times. Uh, just to confirm, the application seeks planning permission for the retention of one pair of vehicular access gates and a pedestrian gate serving each of the properties along with a linking section of fence between the two gates that straddle the boundary between both properties. In addition, sections of connecting fence connecting the gates to a, a realigned western boundary fence are also proposed for Grantham House this consists of the retention of approximately 2.1 metres of fencing to the north of the gates and for Crawley House, the retention of approximately 1.8 metres of fence to the south of the gates. The remaining fence structures, which you will see on the uh, photos, which are in situ, are not matters for the consideration of the application. It is purely for those elements you can see on this photo uh, in relation to the gates and the gate wings. Thank you. Nothing further to add. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Licorice, you have four minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members. Thank you for the opportunity to again register my objection and those of many fellow residents of Highclere. I'm Katie Licorice and I live at the Highclere Red House directly opposite the site of this retrospective application. As you are aware, your committee instructed enforcement action to be taken for the removal of these gates, fence wings and fencing at your meeting in September 2020. You refused them retrospective permission on the grounds of the cumulative effect of height, length, prominence, style, and impact on the AONB. Since your decision, nothing has changed to negate your reasons for refusal. Gates and fence wings remain exactly the same position. They have not been lowered or modified in any way to make them less prominent and also thereby allow views through to the surrounding countryside. The style has not been changed, nor their length. Consider an application for the gates and fence wings in isolation to adopt the salami principle of planning. Gates, fence wings and fencing must be considered as one package due to their overall impact, just as they were when you made your decision in September and not as piecemeal. Your decision in September should be adhered to and acted upon by the applicants. The unauthorised erection of these two metre high gates and fence wings are direct and deliberate breaches of the clear conditions set out in the appeal decision letter issued by Inspector Joanne Jones when she expressly stated that no gates to the highway may be erected without prior LPA permission and that only hedging and trees should form the boundary in order to preserve the rural character of the AONB and to maintain views through to the countryside beyond. Obviously, no views are possible through solid two metre high gates. The gates and fence wings are visually intrusive. They dominate the street scene and spoil the rural feel of our village. They have created a 
totally unacceptable level of traffic noise deflection that is detrimental to both our home and business, and they are not in any way, shape, or form in keeping with either the High Clear Village design statement or the AONB. It should be possible to find a solution for the gates and all the fencing that is in tune with the rural setting and local vernacular, not an import from suburbia, which it currently is. In conclusion, allowing this retrospective application to be approved in isolation, when your committee has already refused these gates, fence wings and fencing as a whole, make a complete mockery of the planning permission system. It is again thumbing a nose at the inspector and her conditions and at your own policies to maintain a holistic approach to sustaining or improving the quality of the landscape. Would let down the many villagers who had faith in both the original conditions and then your committee's decision in September being adhered to in the first place. I would ask you to stick to the opinion that your committee expressed in September continuing to recognise that these gates are ash and completely and unnecessarily out of keeping with their surroundings and to therefore refuse this application until a solution is found to mitigate cumulative impact of the gates, wing fences and fencing together. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much and your timing is very good. Uh, members, questions to the speaker? I've got one. Um, you stated that these uh, gates and the wings uh, have not been moved at all. Nothing has happened in terms no. of relocating them. No, have not moved at all. They have not been lowered, moderated, moved in any way, shape or form. Thank you. Anybody else questions to the speaker? Ms. Licorice, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Young, please. Hello. Good evening, Mr. Young. Uh, you have four minutes. Off you go. Thank you very much. Councillors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for affording me the opportunity to speak to this application. Uh, as you uh, indicated, I'm the agent. Um, the application before you is just for the retention of the gates and its side wings. The frontage fences have been relocated since you considered an application in, in September that focused on them, and they are not within the application. The update indicates that my clients and I remain in discussion with your officers regarding the fences. In many respects, I should not need to be here. To, to explain why I am, I need to take you back to the appeal decision for the buildings that are now Grantham House and Crawley House. That permission was issued in 2016, February, more than two and a half years before Mr. Gervin and Miss May bought Crawley House and nearly three before Mr. and Mrs. Randall bought Grantham House. Mrs. Licorice, in her representation to the application now before you, draws, application, draws attention to a plan which includes sections across the scheme, and that plan shows gates. Crucially, the plan Mrs. Licorice refers to is listed as one of the approved plans in the appeal decision, and your officers are aware of this. So while the inspector decided in 2016 that gates at the properties would need permission, she simultaneously felt able to include a plan within the approved set that shows gates. Even setting that dichotomy aside, a condition relating to the landscaping of the site, which also included reference to gates, was later discharged by the council's officers in February 2017. That was still over 18 months before Mr. Gervin and Miss May bought Crawley House. So while there's been a lot of concern regarding the fences since, and I fully expect to be back in front of you in due course regarding those, the matter of the gates should have been presented in actual fact as closed and closed well before you considered the application in September. And of course, that application was recommended for approval then, even with the full context for the gates not being provided to you. In summary, my clients inherited problems that were not of their own making. They have nonetheless sought to remedy them. However, the understanding of those problems has been compounded by an incomplete picture of the planning situation regarding the gates being presented to you in September. The oversights were small, but they are crucial. Since before the last application and continuing since September, 
my clients are working and have worked with your officers to find a suitable way forward to, and solve the problems for the properties. This has involved moving the fences back from the road by a, a meter and a half. No part of them is now within two meters of the highway surfaces, including the footpaths. However, that's again references to the gates and this, uh, sorry, the fences and this application is for the gates. You have one minute. Thank you. Our position is that the planning history means that there was no need or scope for the committee to consider the gates in September, but for reasons that we have outlined, it did, albeit as an afterthought. The application now before you seeks to draw these disparate strands together. So moving on and trying to look forward, your officers are recommending approval of the current gates application, as in their view, it would not result in significant impacts on the local landscape character and the access arrangement is such that it would not result in adverse impact on highway safety. My clients hope you agree, and then we can all move forwards. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Young. Members, questions for the applicant? No questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Young. Thank you. Councillor Faulkner, please. Evening, Graham. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> and Graham, you have four minutes. Off you go. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'll try to be brief because I think a lot of the points have already been covered. And, it, and indeed, I'd hope that um, you know, this saga had finished on the 11th of September, when you may remember when you um, refused the application for the fence. I mean, the gates have now been separated from that fence, and hence we've got this new application. But as the agent uh, has said, um, although the fence was removed, it was relocated within two metres of its previous position. And um, our officers, the enforcement, have been in communication with the, the applicants ever since September um, and discussing whether that fence that's been moved back two metres is within permitted development or whether, in fact, it is adjacent to the highway and still constitutes a hazard which um, uh, is unacceptable. And so that application or certificate for lawless, lawfulness will come to you again, uh, hopefully uh, within the next month. Um, I, I still stand as I have been for the last six months in that I support the objections of the parish council and of the residents of Highclere. The whole thing does need to be considered as an entity. Um, You've got these huge gates, which when you go back to the appeal inspector's report, he specified that, or she specified that those, that sort of gate was not going to be acceptable. Um, but nevertheless, it should be considered as a whole and just moving the fence back two metres and leaving the rest of the edifice really is an unsatisfactory position. So I would re reiterate my support for the objectors and also for your decision which you made last year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Faulkner. Uh, members, any questions to the Ward Councillor? No, nope. thanks very much, Graham. Thank oh, excuse me, Councillor McCall? No, no, okay. Thanks, Councillor Faulkner. Questions to officers? I'll start off. Um, officers, uh, I'm looking at page 220 of the report. The refuse and enforce on the 11th of September, consequent, subsequently went to appeal. That did include the entrance gates, did it not? Sorry, Councillor, the, um, the appeal actually relates to when no, no. the... Oh, sorry, sorry. say that again. Now, the decision of this council yes. was to refuse the application, it says here on page 220, to include the entrance gates. Yes. So we refused the application that included the entrance gates. Yes. Um, it 
appeared that the consideration was the basis of all all the elements together combined had a, a detrimental impact. So the fencing for both Grantham House and Crawley House together with the gates had a detrimental impact. That was the conclusion that, off, that um, members reached, yep. Fine, because my question on subsequent to that is, then how can we uh, look at these as a single entity when we refused the whole thing? We're a little bit out of whack here because uh, we could look at them as an individual entity, but we looked at it in the round. But now we're, and this has been mentioned by the speakers, we're now looking at piecemeal. Yeah, uh, there is nothing to prevent an applicant applying for certain elements of, of development. Um, and indeed, the agent has set out that they've actually amended the position of the fencing, ah, which, but, which... But that's not relevant to what we've got tonight. That's no. my point. So right. all that we are considering tonight is the retention of those gates and the wings associated with the gates. Um, there is nothing to preclude you from making a, 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 a different decision because you're considering the impact of just that element, not the entire length of fencing and gates. Thank you very much. So we refused them and the inspector refused them. That's all I wanted to establish. Right, Councillor Bound followed by Robinson. Councillor Miller, sorry, could yeah. I just reiterate it? Um, the, the, when the inspector considered the two dwelling application, um, there were originally entrance gates shown on the plans. The uh, applicant to try and address one of the reasons for refusal of the original scheme for two dwellings removed the access gates because that then removed the highway safety concern. The highway safety concern was because the access gates at the time of the consideration of the original two dwellings was too close to the highway, which prevented vehicles safely leaving the carriageway. This application shows gate or has gates which are set far enough back from the highway to mitigate that harm that was uh, was in place at when the appeal was considered. So it is not the same as when the appeal uh, for the two dwellings was considered, just to, to reiterate no, that. The, the appeal I was referring to was the appeal against our decision to refuse it last September, which had nothing to do with the dwellings. It had only to do with the fence and the gates. So we moved on from the original removal of the gates from the plans. This is why I was getting a little bit obscured by the applicant. We are look, our, our timing on this starts from last September. Yes, just to say there hasn't been a planning appeal with the inspectorate for the refusal that count, that uh, the committee made in September last year. There, there isn't so, a planning appeal. Okay, so we are now just talking about an enforcement that hasn't been carried out, uh, a, a refusal that hasn't been satisfied. Correct. Or, or the applicant believes that they have addressed some of it because they've moved the fences, but not this no. applicant, not this application. Yeah. But not this application. There's where it's getting confusing. It really has been, uh, there's obscuration here, and I'm just trying to bring some clarity. That's all. So we're talking about gates. We're not talking about fences. The fences Correct. are still where they were when we refused the application in September. That the gates are and the wings, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> right. Councillor George, followed by Councillor Bound, followed by Councillor Potter, I believe. No. Start off with Councillor George, followed by Councillor Potter. Uh, uh, Councillor Bound. I'll get this right yes. in a minute. Thank you. Um, and just a question to the officers. I, I think looking at page 229, um, you know, I suppose this really comes back to this point of the, the thing being cut up into pieces. But if you look at the street scene plan, you seem to have a low fence on the right hand side and a high fence on the left hand side and what have you, you, you know, and gates in the middle of a different height. Is, you know, I think, uh, you know, Mr. Mr. Young mentioned the presence of gates on these plans we approved but what what is, is is heights mentioned anywhere because clearly there's there you know it's not just the presence of the gates and the what have you it's it's that looking at the whole thing as a single seat stream stream and the consistency between the fence no. and the gates and everything else no. isn't it but you no. can't see that at all no C could i 
sorry, can I just draw your attention to page 228, the proposed site plan, and there is an area of darker um, line in the central part of the site. That is the only bit of the development, uh, that is the development that's being considered this evening. Um, and on 229, again, it is the darker area of in the central part uh, below the word plan. The street scene plan includes elements which aren't within the application site. Yeah, exactly. I see, thank you. Councillor Byrne. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm just referring to that on page 228, the darker bit that you've just referred to, Lucy. And also sort of trying to tie that in with the inspector's decision, which he allowed when he says um, amenity space and new vehicular access with associated works. So is that the associated works? That that dark bit as shown on page two to eight. Sorry, can I just ask you to confirm, Councillor Bound, which page you're then referring to about the inspector's comments? You're muted, Mike. There you are. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, on page 220, um, the, um, on the relevant planning history, the bottom bit, it says, and new vehicular access with associated works. Now, the associated works I'm taking are, as shown on page 228, the bit that you refer to in black, that sort of heavy black line. Is that right? Past that. Yeah, uh, no, Councillor Bound, it, it, it isn't the same plan. Um, the application 1500583 was the original permission which uh, had been recommended and was refused by uh, Basingstoke and Dean, but the inspectorate allowed the appeal. However, during the consideration of the appeal, uh, the plans initially or, or did show access gates um, uh, and, and boundary treatment, which the inspector felt were not appropriate and not acceptable. And during the consideration of the appeal, the appellants removed the um, access gates from consideration of of the application to remove the highway safety reason for refusal. These access gates are in a different location to the appeal um, plans. So it, it isn't the same plan that you're looking at on under this application. Okay, so the, the, those gates which were taken out of the original appeal, um, they've now been repositioned so that they allow safe access onto the highway with proper sight lines. I, I don't know if they're exactly the same, uh, but in terms of the acceptability and highway safety, the gates as proposed this evening or as, as on site are acceptable in relation to highway safety because they are set back far enough from the carriageway. I got there in the end. Okay, thank you. But they weren't acceptable in September when we turn the application down. That's the point. Well, I think the only thing was that the fence was being considered then as well, Chair. Uh, yes, which is why I come back to my point. We're now being asked to do this piecemeal instead of going back to the whole thing. But if that's how they are permitted to do it, fine. But these gates weren't acceptable then. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll let this go on. And Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. Um... All I was going to ask is, could we have another look at the um, photos on the visualizer, please? We are still in questions to officers at the moment, aren't we? Yes, we are. Right, fine. I've got more for debate, but yes. Particularly, right, that's the... And that is the position... Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Right. Anybody else for the officers, Councillor Tomlin? Thank you, Chair. Um, OK, um, observation. The photographs that we have on the visualiser of the gates are not in accordance with the plan or the street scene plan. So how do we proceed? They are different. If you look, the, there is a tapered element down to a, a lower fence that we're not talking about. And it's shown in the plan as being, um, you know, part of that elevation of the street scene. You look at the photos, they do not accord. So are we looking at the photo or are we looking at the plan? Because they've gone and if we approve this plan, they need enforcement because they're wrong already. I, what do the officers make of that? It's the two do not agree. Sorry, I don't know if you could elaborate a little bit more on what you think is wrong, because you've got obviously the. OK, so if you look at page 229. Yeah. And you look at the plan. Yeah. You can see the black line on the left and the right has a like a, a, a break line, a vertical break line, zigzag line, which signifies, yeah, a, you know, a break in, in there. If you then look at the uh, elevation, the where Grantham House and Crawley House are shown, yeah. You'll see that the corresponding uh, from the right hand pair of gates, it shows a wing dropping down in height. OK, and then a small section of yep. low fence, if you correlate to the plan. And then on the other side is a high fence and a slightly tapered fence going down to the gate. Now you look at the photographs. And there's none of that apparent. It's just straight gates, straight vertical panels. There's no yep. dropping down to lower. So they're different. OK, so I, I'm afraid. Well, I would say we can't do anything because it's wrong. Everything, we, the information we've been given is wrong. Either they've not built it to the plans they want us to approve or the plans they want us to approve are wrong. But we can't assume that because that's what they presented. So, so I'm sorry, but I, I think I'm right <laughs> on that. But what do we do? Off, um, you, you would need to consider the, the plans as submitted. It may be that what is constructed on site is not what they are proposing. There is an element um, adjacent to Crawley House where they have a lower fence, so the the uh, gate wing tapers down to meet the lower fence adjacent to Crawley House. Yeah, that's exactly the point, and but it's not not as on the visualizer. Correct. I will second that. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Agree with you there, Councillor. Yeah. Tomlin. So, so we have to consider it as shown on the plan, um, and obviously we would need to then draw attention to the applicants that there is a a, a section which is different on site to what they are proposing with this application. Okay, right, thank you. Councillor Robinson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <laughs> put the cat among the pigeons. Okay, Jane, I have spotted you, don't worry. Councillor Tomlin is right, the plans don't agree, but the difference in the plans appears to relate to the fence, and we are not discussing the fence tonight. That's correct. There is a section of fence that we are considering, which are the wings related to um, yes. the gates themselves. The so, yeah, yes. um, just to say there is a section of fence we are you, you are considering this evening. OK, fine. Thank you. Just, yeah, that's fine. It's clear. Councillor Frankham. Um, yes, I think anybody, member of the public, that would be looking on would be as confused as I am. Mm. Uh, would it not be an idea to defer this and it to come back um, with it being a little bit more clearer, please? I'll take that under advisement, Councillor Franken, but yes, duly noted. Um, again, I've got a question to officers. We refused 
a fence and gates in September. The gates have now been presented to us with no change, no difference at all. And we're being asked to approve it. Uh, I have got, uh, to me, that's illogical. Because it, just the fact, the gates were included in our refuse and enforce decision on the 11th of September. I, I appreciate your comments, Councillor Miller. Um, What's well, a question? There is, there is nothing to stop uh, an applicant for applying for part of a development. If, if the whole of the scheme was unacceptable, it doesn't mean that a part of that development in isolation would also be unacceptable. So you have to reconsider that on its own merits. But I Fair appreciate enough. your comments. OK, thank you. Um, did you want to comment on Councillor Frankham's uh, suggestions as well? Sorry, can yes. you repeat that? Uh, no, Jane, you made a comment about that confusion. Yeah. I was going back to the officer to ask if she came up. Did you want to comment on what Councillor Frankham said? Councillor Frankham, were you suggesting that the application is deferred for then considering all of the elements? I, I think it need, we need some clarity. Um, just to confirm, so the we are considering just this element of the application. I, I appreciate your, your comments, but we can't require the applicant to increase the the amount of development that they're proposing with this application. Um, it is a, a separate scheme now. Um, I, I do appreciate your comments, but that is the basis on which they've submitted the application and that's how we have to determine it. Okay, then obviously we vote with um, those. Okay, thank you. Councillor Potter. Well, I think, Chair, you've hit the nail on the head a couple of times. I mean, I don't generally think this is as complicated as we're making it. Simply, our decision when we rejected um, what we had before us going back that 12 months ago was that we rejected the gates that were being presented and visually available for us to see, and also the wings that went with it. Now, simplifying our application tonight as we're being told to do that element of what we looked at last time is as before as the access gates and fence wings we found that unacceptable that short time ago as far as i'm concerned nothing has changed since then and my rejection then would apply tonight as well and i think we simplify it in the way that the application is written no more than that really and as far as i'm concerned i don't want to support this application before us tonight Right, thank you. Uh, would, does anyone have any more questions for the officers? Have we got this clear in our minds? If we have, I'm going to move to debate and I'll count Councillor Potter's comments in the debate. Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not sure whether I have a slight advantage on everybody on this because I wasn't at the previous hearing in September. So for me, I'm sort of coming to it from a fresh perspective. And it, the whole thing seems to hinge on when you looked at this before, and I say you because I wasn't there, you looked at it as gates and fence and you refused it. The question is, which element of that did you find unacceptable? If it was the fence that you found unacceptable, and the gates were acceptable, then this should go forwards. If it was the gates you found that were unacceptable, then this should be refused because basically you've already refused it. That seems to be the, the crux of it to me, is why did you refuse it last time? Did you refuse it because of the fence or did you refuse it because of the gates? Councillor Potter has clearly indicated he refused it because of the gates. And that is the whole crux of the thing, is why did, which element of it did you refuse, not like last time? Because well, I hope Lucy's gonna say what I was about to say, but- Sorry, do you want to on. say it, Councillor Miller? Sorry. On page 220, under the relevant <laughs> planning history, uh, 2000679 retrospective, if you just read that, if you've got the document in front of you, it includes the entrance gates. Erection of fence inside the boundary of the A343 to include entrance gates, refuse and enforce. Yes, Lizzie. 
Um, yeah, actually, page 221 is the committee um, uh, resolution from September, which was by virtue of the proposed fence and gates, ah, yes. length, yes. height, style and prominence. Yep. Um, yeah, so it was the sort of cumulative impact of, of yep. those elements together. It's the fifth sort of paragraph down that particular page. Yes, Mike. Yeah, just to follow on from, from Lucy's point, and I'm, I'm trying not to elevate this any, any more than necessary, but that, that reason for refusal did reference fence and gates length, height and everything else. So that is why under this application, you would need to come to a new resolution entirely based on the development before you, which is the gates and the fence wings. And it is entirely before you to come to a view as to whether that's approvable or refusable. But because length was relevant in the material issues that you raised previously, you would effectively, if you if if the committee were to consider refusal, then yep. you would need to be satisfied that the length of this element is equally refusable on its merits of just this application. Understood. Crystal clear. Right. In debate, we've had an input from Councillor Potter. I hope we've answered your question, Councillor Robinson. And do I have any more for the debate? Is that a move for uh, refusal, Councillor Potter? Um, yes, Chairman. Thank you very much. And Councillor Harvey? Well, I'll second that and just say, in terms of the reason for refusal, I think the height, the style, the prominence of the proposal resulted in adverse impacts on the character of the area to the detriment of the local landscape and character and scenic quality of the North Wessex Downs area of outstanding natural beauty. And go with that as the original recommendation that was moved last time round, but made appropriate and made relevant to the application, as Mike rightly says, before us this evening. Yes. Um, those matters are still relevant because they are party to the decision this evening with yep. material that is in front of us in, as ever, the red line. Um, so, yeah, I'd second the, uh, the objection on those grounds. Thank you. So the motion is as per Councillor Harvey's just... Well, that's no, right. Motion. Well, Potter moves the motion. Uh, Councillor Potter, are you happy of how Councillor Harvey described that? Uh, more than happy. How can I better that, Chairman? Thank you. It's probably moved and seconded for refusal on that basis. And I'll call the roll. Councillor Robinson. For refusal. <laughs> Councillor Leakes. Four. Councillor Goodison. Four refusal. Councillor George. Four refusal. Councillor Frankham. Four refusal. Councillor Harvey. Four refusal. Councillor McCormick. Four refusal. Councillor Bound. Against. Councillor Potter. Four refusal. Councillor Tomlin. Or refusal. Bernie. That was nine for the recommendation and one against. Thank you, officers. Thank you. So um, that application is, is duly refused. Um, can I just confirm that it is uh, the, the same as the previous reason for refusal, but by virtue of the proposed gates, height, style, and gate wings, uh, sorry, by virtue of the proposed gates and gate wings, length, height, and style and prominence, you know, and then as per the previous reason for refusal. Yeah. Not length. Not length. No, not length. Apart from the length, the other elements remain. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, but to include the wings as per the yes. application. Yes, yeah. thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, it's gone. It's 10 to 9, but I think we've got one application left. And we can crack on and get that one out of the way. And it's, uh, it's number 9. Sorry. Nice. I don't know that one. We had, uh, yeah, number nine, and it's a pip. It's our favourites. So I'm going to ask. Councillor Tyler from the Parish Council to come on board, please. 
Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good evening, Councillor Tyler. And if you'd just like to hang on, sorry you're at the back end of the agenda, but uh, we won't be long. Officers, if you'd like to introduce it. Thank you, Chairman. This application addresses land adjacent to 14 Hackwood Lane, Clitherston, and seeks permission in principle for the erection of two dwellings. Consideration of the development is limited only to the location, land use, and amount of development. There's no update for this application, right. which is recommended for approval. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Councillor Tyler, you've got four minutes. Um, the land related to this application is agricultural land. And it has, for the last hundred years, uh, been an important part of the ecological network between the fields on either side of Hackwood Lane. And as such, um, it wouldn't be in accord with policy EM1. The application does also not accord with EM4 1F, uh, which states there will be no harm to the integrity of linkages between designated sites and key habitats. Just a word on relation to the whole site, the, the current owner has seen, split, seen fit to split this site into two with a, with a laurel hedge and to build a large um, play area on one side, all I might add without uh, any planning application for change of use. The application clearly does not meet um, local plan policy SS6. Now I do understand obviously that it's in, in abeyance due to the current housing land supply, However, the parish council feel that the local plan um, SX6 at least needs to be considered. Two other points are important. First, sustainability. Uh, the site is in the countryside, the nearest shop and bus being by the Holiday Inn on the other side of the M3 motorway. Now this is about two miles from the site. There are no footpaths and the sites are therefore uh, not seriously accessed without anything other than a car which is in conflict with social and environmental objectives in sustainable development. Secondly, in relation to the amenity of neighboring dwellings, um, policy EM10 states, all development proposals will be required to respect the local environment and amenities of neighboring properties. And then para B in that it says, provide a high quality amenity for occupants of developments and neighboring properties, having regard to such issues as overlooking, access to natural light, outlook, amenity space, all in accordance with the design and sustainability SPD. The neighboring property is built right on the boundary of the field and has habitable rooms which face the field. And so thus it would be severely affected by the proposal. So on this point, uh, the Parish Council uh, would request, if you are minded to approve the application, then a significant area of land should be set aside between the development and the adjoining owner, adjacent owner uh, to maintain amenity and to provide a continuation of the wildlife corridor. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much. And I appreciate your timing. Members, questions to the Parish Council? Nope. Thanks very much, Councillor. Mr. Carley, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. And good, good evening. evening, and you have four minutes. Go. Good. good evening, my name is Brian Carley. I live at number 13 Hackwood Lane, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My first point relates to the PIP. I'm concerned that matters that should be considered now are being incorrectly deferred to a TDC. The case officer emailed me to say, I quote, matters relating to trees, biodiversity and landscape would be considered at the TDC stage. However, according to government guidance, and I quote, local authorities should draw on relevant existing information sources to support decisions on whether a grant of permission in principle is appropriate. I have other government guidance references if you need them. A similar PIP at Frog Lane, Little London, reference 193221 slash PIP, was rejected by the case officer on grounds of landscape, quoting EM1, EM10, and the Landscape Biodiversity and Trees SPD. The Frog Lane application was subsequently rejected by the planning inspectorate in October 2020 when it was taken to appeal. There are other PIP examples rejected on landscapes. 
Uh, objections have been raised by Basingstoke and Dean's biodiversity, landscape and trees departments, and these can and should be taken into account, in my opinion, just as they were at Frog Lane and not deferred to a TDC. My second point now relates to a number of concerns about related to location and land use. So again, could and should be considered at the stage. The negative impact on landscape views and character contravening EM1, EM10 and the sustainability in trees SPD. There are views to the countryside and to the heritage park and woodland at Hackwood Park. These would be lost. The CPRE landscape assessment describes the area as a valued landscape and as such should be protected in line with NPPF Power 170. This is not mentioned in the public document pack, in fact. Point B, negative impact on biodiversity, green infrastructure and wildlife corridor, which contravenes EM1, EM4, EM5, NPPF Powers 171 and 174. This is a development on agricultural land and it will sever a wildlife corridor between priority habitats. C, negative impact on protected trees and hedgerows, contradicting EM1, EM10 and landscape biodiversity in trees, SPD. The planning application shows the proposed location of houses, but omits the five TPO protected trees uh, in my property. The tree canopies overhang the plot and the proposed building with no buffer zone. D, this is not a sustainable location. It contravenes policies SS1, SS6, SD1, section 4.6, 4.40, NPPF paragraph 8, 77, 78, 79, 102 and 108. This is the countryside and it's outside the SPB. There are no services, no sustainable transport. Basingstoke and Dean's strategy directs development to existing sustainable settlements, not building in the countryside. Point E, negative impact and light and privacy to a habitable room in my house. Contrary you have one minute. Thank you. And the sustainability SPD. So someone standing in the proposed development garden will straight into my downstairs room. If a fence or a building is erected, it will block light directly into my habitable room on the boundary. F, the site was rejected in the 2018 Sheila due to its location in the countryside. This is not mentioned in the public document pack. Uh, the Frog Lane, sorry, G, the Frog Lane application for a PIP has many similarities and was rejected on landscape grounds. So surely Hackwood Lane should be treated in the same way. Point H, if the PIP is approved and these issues relating to location and land use are deferred to the TDC, then there's a risk the land will be sold to a developer. And there is then a likely to be a long period of wrangling over a series of complex TDC submissions, which should be refused when the issues are fully taken into account. This could then result in a very messy situation. And finally, this type of development just nibbles away at the countryside one plot at a time. And at what point does the incremental development uh, and the erosion of the countryside stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Carley. Members, any questions to the speaker? Councillor McCormack. Well, first, can I say thank you for such an excellent presentation. It's very rare we get such uh, well-informed uh, residents presenting to us at an uh, exceptionally high standard. Um, just uh, looking for your comments, really. I know that road, Hackwood Lane, it's a, it's a complete nightmare sometimes getting along there. A single track road's quite busy. Um, th that particular stretch has got uh, quite a few bits of incremental development already. Um, you mentioned it's kind of like a straw on a camel's back. Um, how much do you think this development is going to impact your amenities on that very tight awkward right. uh, limited visibility single track road you know both with construction traffic and afterwards um firstly i have a a window which is a right on the boundary so i've measured it. it's about 0.2 meters um so if somebody erects a fence it, it will be right on my uh window obscuring my uh light if someone puts up a uh, you know a house there then again it's going to obscure my light it's east fencing uh, east facing i have morning light in that room from the east any building there will completely cut that off and, and cut the light um, then there's the question of privacy again that boundary is so close to the uh, to the edge of my property if someone if there's a garden put there then someone will if they're standing in that garden will be right against my window and able to look into my uh, downstairs room uh, it's a habitable room it's a chalet bungalow um, in terms of construction traffic 
Um, I'll just say that we have, there's another case going on up at Station Road at the moment. It's caused enormous problems. The parish council, I think, has been making complaints about the lack of parking when they built one single house uh, along Station Road, causing no end of damage to the uh, the surface and the, uh, uh, the the verge. So certainly access for uh, any kind of construction is, is going to be very difficult because it's very, very tight, likely to cause more damage to the uh, the hedgerows and the, um, the verges along that stretch of the road. Thank you. Any more questions to the speaker? No. Nope. Thank you, Mr. Carney. Thank you. Mr. Prebdow, please. Hello all, I'm hoping you can hear me. Yes, loud and clear, you have four minutes. Thank you very much. So first of all, thank you so much for having, uh, giving us the opportunity to address you. Um, in fact, having reviewed the report, I'd like to thank the planning officer for her effort to represent a well-balanced position. I, I think it was fairly factual and clear. I, I'd just like to make you aware of a couple of things that the uh, previous speaker has mentioned. Um, the, the previous speaker has actually approached me on several unsolicited requests to uh, provide them with the portion of land for five meters by 60 meters and said that that would go a long way in his support. He also made mention that he has several influence with the council and direct responsible responsibility for the parish housing strategy, which I find very disingenuous. Furthermore, um, there are photographs that have been submitted to the public press whilst mentioning privacy um, these have been taken by a drone which overlooks our children's play area and our private garden. Uh, and as you can appreciate, that does have severe consequences. Um, going back forward to our considerations of Hackwood Lane, um, I'd like to bring to your attention that Hackwood Lane has not had a lot of broadband for several years. And uh, we've actually uplifted the broadband from three megabits to 60 megabits solely on our actions with GigaNet. We've applied to the Rural Broadband Scheme for the road and invested direct funding, which none of the neighbors wanted to contribute to a new cabinet, and we paid open reach directly, uh, in order to work from home. And during the lockdown, some of the neighbors mentioned their thanks, that they were actually progressing you know, with their work. Surprisingly, two of these neighbors have actually objected to the PIP. So I find that very interesting. Um, regarding the housing demand, we'd like to reiterate that the location, the land use, and the amount of development has been considered acceptable. Um, considering that the council could not demonstrate a five-year housing uh, uh, land supply. Furthermore, the proposal is considered in accordance with paragraph 11 of the National Plan Planning Framework Policy. And on consideration of this plot, I would like to remind the panel that we actually li live right next door to the plot. So we don't want to exploit the planning potential for four plus houses as others may choose to have done so. Hence, we're asking for only two homes in a half an acre plot keeping in lane with keeping in, in, in density with the lane and allowing for other homes in keeping with this location and the tranquility. Um, in regards to landscaping and environments, um, in, in complete contradiction to our neighbor's objections, um, we can confirm that the plot has been mowed frequently, that the native hedge has been tended to, though it struggles with a severe infection of ivy and we do prune it. And whilst the land is not designated for site biodiversity, as strong eco-warriors we have planted, planted 50 trees on our property. We do remain firm that the existing tree line that has been pointed out will be protected and preserved of any development. And we plan to work with this in mind. On the you have subject, one minute, sir. Thank you. On the subject of location, um, with regards to the <clears throat> access on these homes, it is similar for the access on the rest of the row of houses, all being on one side of the road. From recent planning applications, um, the, these two houses on half an acre is actually a lower density then the other recent approvals in Clidiston and in fact on our road and, and the other applications that had the broad similar challenges at this PIP, yet they've been approved for more houses per acre. And the highway review has cited this development as unlikely to cause any adverse impacts. Being in a straight part of the road and having lived on the lane for 10 years, I can vouch for the visibility displays as, as we have actually done work on the visibility displays to fall in line with Highways Council. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Members, questions to the applicant? None? Mr. Prabdal, thank you very much. Thank you. 
Councillor Raphael. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to address the meeting. I'm assuming no you, can, uh, you can hear me good. Uh, yep. So, four areas for the committee to exercise their judgment. Uh, local need, sustainability, whether the policies are offended uh, to such an extent that uh, planning in principle shouldn't be granted or whether they are so trivially offended they can be dealt with by way of conditions and how much weight to give to the policies in the local plan, uh, given there's a lack of five-year land supply. I think we're all agreed, because I've heard your comments earlier, uh, of the nature of Hackwood Lane. It is where housing is in the open countryside, but they are intermittent, surrounded by fields, and there's no sense of needing to be joined up because you're not at the centre of a community. Indeed, it's about a mile walk to the pub, and as already been said, it's impossible to walk uh, straight into Basingstoke from where, where it is. So it's in the open countryside. Uh, you, you've seen what the officers said about local need when they looked at policy SS6E. Uh, so we, we uh, that's me and this committee, have debated that policy many times. Uh, you as a committee, regularly want to be generous on it uh, and the officers regularly want to be strict on it. Well it seems to fail both tests, both the strict one according to the officers and clearly fails the generous test because there is no locally agreed need, it's locally agreed that they don't need this house uh, and uh, clearly they fail uh, to demonstrate with any evidence according to the officers that there is a local need and it according to the council's landscape officer, would harm the landscape. So we move on to sustainable. I actually think, and you probably know this is my view, that uh, that word is bandied around uh, so much that it is, in the circumstances of this particular uh, case, it's quite difficult to narrow it down. Because on one hand, you could say it's in an unsustainable location. But on the other hand, you could quite see, well, other people are happily living there, aren't they? So um, it, it's for you to make of that what you want, but it's clearly remote from the centre of Clidderston, remote from the centre of other populations, uh, and uh, uh, people uh, require cars to get to wherever they want to go. Uh, so then we move on to um, the local plan policies. And you will remember that the Court of Appeal recent, in a recent uh, Gladman's case, and I emphasise it's Court of Appeal, said that uh, local plan policies are relevant and should be taken into account uh, when considering when there isn't a five-year land supply, should be taken into account. However, it's a question of how much weight you give them because the lack of five-year land supply. Now, I'm told by officers that that wasn't a surprise to them because you've been doing it all the, all the way along. Uh, what about a minute, Councillor? So I urge you to apply the local plan policies and, and appreciate that this uh, is open countryside and therefore should be protected, that it does harm the landscape by uh, joining it up so it becomes like a ribbon of housing along that road. Uh, and uh, th there is no need for it. And as uh, uh, the parish chairman said, it offends other policies too. And, and in my submission, because it's unnecessary, it offends the policies, um, you have good grounds to reject it. Thank you very much. Members, any questions for the ward councillor? Councillor Bound. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, Councillor Ruffel. Um, I'm not particularly um, familiar with this location. On my location plan on page 250, um, on the left hand side, there's um, plot 13 and it goes up to 14A. Um, that ribbon development there, over what, sort of length of, over what sort of length does it go from number one up to whatever it goes on to beyond 14A? Well, I, I let um, Councillor McCormick uh, uh, assist you on this, but I would say the road length is probably about a quarter of a mile. From, from the, the bend where the, the house on the corner is, uh, which is probably number one, 
uh, to where it breaks out onto the 339, the busy 339 Autumn Odium Road. Are there more houses beyond 14A? Um, I can't see your plan, I'm afraid, because if I do that, I oh, don't see okay. you. Um, okay. uh, from when I looked at it, um, uh, I, I, can, I can have a look at my phone, but when I looked at it, my impression was that there are about four houses uh, to the east, in other words, going towards the 339. Now, that might be five. I don't think it's three, but it's, it's not that many. It's at that end. OK, thank you. If I can help you, I've just got Google Maps up and it's four houses. Oh, if you okay. see me, I, was, I, I went few. <laughs> <laughs> went few, yeah. <laughs> Any more questions for the ward councillor? No, thanks very much indeed, councillor Raphael. And questions to officers? Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chef. You wouldn't unmute. Um, I've been waiting for a pip to come up for a little while. Um, I hate them. Um, the first pip we did was, unfortunately, the one we did in Bramley, and it was granted, and it's got three years. And a little while later, we came across. An, I came across another pip which had been granted, and it came in for technical submission, um, and it was in North Waltham. And the pepper on that one had only been granted for one year. Why do we grant them sometimes for one year? Why do we grant them for three years? What's the criteria between, between doing the two? What's the reasoning? So I didn't um, realise when we did the one in Bramley that you could actually limit them to one year. Otherwise, I probably would have tried to. So I'd like to know what sits behind that one year or three year granting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I understand, yes, there has been some variation in the timescales for, um, for the PIP applications, where there has been consideration initially that because of our shortage in housing land supply, this has been reduced in some instances. However, um, in discussion with college, I understand that has actually since been considered to be unreasonable, and therefore we shouldn't really be doing that. But that's the position that we have had on different applications, but where we've still been finding our feet with this new legislation. OK, so the situation we are in now is that all PIPs are three years. That is correct. That's my understanding that, yes, they should be for three years. Wonderful. Thank you, Catherine. Any more questions on this PIP debate? I'd like to kick this off. Councillor McCormack. It is... I really do feel for the um, the, the um, residents on this one. Um, I'm I'm kind of leading towards refusal on this. Um, yeah, it's only two houses, and you could you could take those two houses in isolation, and you could say it's it, it's not a huge amount. But when you actually look, I mean, we would have benefited from a site visit, but you you can pick up quite a bit from Google Maps as well if you're viewing the, that in real time there is quite a bit of development there. And also if you look at uh, Station Road, it, it carries on, there's there's quite a bit round there. So in effect, what we've got is uh, a strip <clears throat> development of about half a mile that extends from the A339 almost to where Clidston Station was. And then a little bit of green of about a quarter of a mile. And then you're in the rest of Clidston, the main part of Clidston Village. So, I'm minded to um, turn some of the reasons for refusal round and uh, state that it goes against uh, policy asset 6E of the local plan um, and uh, contrary to policies EM1 and EM10 and EM10 in as much as the impact on the area and the amenities of residents. And I know from my personal experience, that's a, a single track lane with obscured sight lines and you almost always, if you do go down it, either meet pedestrians or horses 
or cars or people on bicycles because it's that seems to be very popular now with, with, with what the lockdown cycling around the south of Basingstoke extremely popular so um yeah i i'm i'm minded to move refusal Councillor potter <laughs> thank you chair um I mean, we've commented on the um, legislation that covers this, I think dating back to 2016 many times, and I think we're all agreed that it was an unnecessary and uh, unhelpful piece of legislation, but nevertheless, it is, it is legislation, it is the law. And I think we need to remind ourselves, and we're drawn into it time and time again, that we get into discussions really on matters which should be covered by the technical details consent. And if you confine it to the PIP itself, which is very limited, looking at location, land use, and amount of development. Um, I think this PIP application stands up to those tests, and I support the officer's view, really, so I take a different view to Councillor McCormick. Um, I'm not sure which order you'll take anything in anyway, Chair, but really I should be supporting the officer's recommendation for this PIP application, bearing in mind many of the reservations that uh, colleagues are talking about and some of the objectors are talking about, fit into the next stage of technical details consent if we are to if we were to approve this this evening chair thank you councillor potter councillor bound i would just like to um follow up on what um david has said chair i, I mean i don't see that there's any reason to turn it down unfortunately and um, we're caught, continually caught up in this cycle of these pips where we don't really seem to have recourse to to refuse, so um, I will be minded to um, approve it actually. Okay, I'd just like to make my own comment here. It's uh, really something that was highlighted by Councillor Raffel is that as the PIPs have been around, the legislation passed in 2016, and there have been various PIPs obviously around the, the country, there has been some uh, appeal decisions which have uh, Frog Lane, I wrote it down. Um, I think most of us remember Frog Lane when we went down there. And it's, um, it was interesting, the refusal or the appeal was turned down for the various reasons that we think should be included in TDC. Now, that to me is, is relevant. Now, uh, if the inspector is using existing policies, our own policies, by the way, we haven't, we've been short of a five-year land supply for quite some time now. And it was certainly a, a, on during the time of Frog Lane what, um, application. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sort of, personally, I'm kind of torn about this. If, if the inspector is using TDC environments, such as details of landscape and everything else, um, and the details of landscape to bolster up a rejection of a PIP. I don't see why we can't use them. Um, that, I, I, it's difficult. This is a very difficult situation. I think we all endorse that. Councillor Harvey. I think your point here about an appeal is relevant in the context that an appeal inspector may chimp come to a decision another appeal inspector may not come to the same decision. Mm. The issue here is that the appeal inspector drawing on various elements, we don't have a five-year housing land supply at the moment, and that is a real, real issue for us with terms of our policy framework. We have a law that relates to PIPs, and if we've got a problem with the PIP and the process, then we've got a problem with the law. And, you know, I would be appealing to Councillor Raphael to be writing to the ministers saying, for Christ's sake, will you please change the law? Because it's the law that's causing us the frustration in all of this, please. The context of this site, and it has to be the context of this site, is interesting because when you do Google Earth the area, you are talking about 20 odd development sites, 20 odd parcels of land that are already developed. And as the pit looks at landscape and looks at context, the problem with this application is that what is being proposed is not out of landscape character no. to that community. And that's the problem. We might not like it. We might not support it. We might not want it. I get that. But the context, our hands are tied. If there was a get out of jail card with these pips, it would be beautiful, wouldn't it? 
Well, there isn't. The law is the law. And until that changes, I get why the officers have had to recommend approval. And I'm, to be honest with you, really frustrated with that. I really, really am. So, um, yeah, Councillor Raphael, will you please write to the ministers and tell them to change the law? Because I think most of us sat around the table would welcome that. Uh, sustainability is the other one. Um, sustainability also relates, Chair, to the, to the context. And again, is it sustainable yeah. in, in the plots of land? And, and, and if it's sustainable for those 20 houses, how could it not be sustainable for two more if that's all that's being asked for? Seven, eight, exactly. Eight, have they, even though it's in a very rural position in the countryside, have they now those houses in existence have now endorsed sustainability? That's the problem. That is the problem because that's how yeah. the law is written. Yeah. If it wasn't written that way, it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Um, I've got a you're right, Councilor McCormack. I've got to figure out how we do this. Um, Mike, Councilor McCormack was moving for a refusal. I've now got a motion, a uh, mover and a seconder for approval. Uh, Councilor McCormack was first. Do I ask him for a seconder and then move that, and then move yeah. to the other one? Did You've frozen. I've spoken to Councillor McCormack from, from my connection. Um, and so if, 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 that, if there wasn't a motion from Councillor McCormack and you do have a motion and a seconder um, from Councillor Potter, then you'd obviously take that one first. But I, I'll be honest, I didn't actually record any, any actual motions. Actual motion. uh, I, know, I know there was discussion about okay. talking okay. in support of, but perhaps the is coming in, I can see. Uh, Councillor McCormack, I, 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 I see you, Councillor Goodison. Did you make a motion on that one? Yes, I think uh, I've got some uh, outline reasons outline. from SS6C, EM1, EM10 policies that we can use. Okay, well, I'll take that. I've got a, a seconder from Councillor Goodison. Sorry, Councillor Miller, I think Anne wants to speak. Oh, sure. Oh, you've got no camera. I beg your pardon. I'm expecting a camera. Yeah, Anne, please proceed. Um, sorry, Councillor, I don't have a, a camera. Um, mm. You should take the, the person who put the proposal first. You should look to see whether or not there's a seconder to that yes. proposal. And if there is no seconder, then you can go on to take the alternative proposal. Yep, that's exactly what I was doing. But thank you for the reinforcement. So, Councillor McCormack uh, and Councillor Goodison, you're seconding Councillor McCormack? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Right, right. These are. This is a motion for refusal of the PIP, and you've already quoted the uh, policies under that. Uh, yes, uh, SS six E um, EM one country TM one and EM ten as well. Mike. Yeah, just, just just for clarity, because obviously to make sure that any any vote taken is 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 is, is on, on sort of sound plan, planning reasons. So on, on the SS6E, that is that is if you like on a on a principal development issue. So so simply the the being contrary to the development plan in in, in that way. Um, Chair, if I may just provide some commentary on that, just to assist the committee, if, if please do. Um, so. Effectively, I think um, Councillor Raphael is absolutely right. There's been court of appeal uh, decisions recently saying that you, 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 you clearly you can apply weight to your local plan even when you, you've not got five years supply and your, and your um, uh, policies are out of date. But uh, the, the amount of weight is for the decision taker, so in this instance, the committee. So the, the amount of weight is, 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 is for you to determine what that weight is. But it doesn't change the position that you still need to apply the, the, the tilted balance of paragraph 11 of the MPPF as set out in the report. And that um, uh, uh, test, if you like, is that the um, uh, adverse impacts of development have to significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits. So each reason for refusal has to kind of stand within that, that test, if you like. Yeah. So just simply the, the being contrary to the development plan in principle you would need to be satisfied that there is um, sufficient weight to that when considering the benefits and it would significantly and demonstrably outweigh those benefits. So, so that would be the one advice on, on that first reason for refusal put forward. 
on, on the second point, EM, EM1 and EM10, EM1 is clearly more around the policy is more around landscape impacts. So my yeah. my understanding would be that, that is, is, is where Councillor McCormack is, is thinking around around that, given the commentary and, and from, from the landscape office, etc. So um, if that could just be confirmed. And then on EM10, that's the broader, obviously, development control policy, uh, citing a number of issues. So it would just be useful to have clarity as to which element of EM10 um, was, 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 was being breached for, for the motion chair. Right. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor McCormack, you're quite happy with those? I am, yes. And, and I think uh, listening to the um, representations of um, local resident about the potential impact on his immunity, you know, view and whatever, but also the nature of that um, congested lane and adding to what is already a problem. I think it, 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 that's that's what's foremost in my mind in terms of the adverse impact. And as far as EM10 is concerned, I've got it open in front of me. Um, is it one particular element of EM10? Well, I don't happen to have EM10 in right. front of me at the moment. And in, but in terms of, yeah, the, 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 the title is Delivering High Quality Development. I mean, I think it's... Yes. It's not. It, it's not a high quality development in as much as it's a, it's a, it's a strip that's grown up on a, a country lane, uh, and and we're just exacerbating the existing problems. And I think, in in terms, of the, the problem's going to get worse even if it stayed the same because we have a lot of new users of country lanes in the form of cyclists and, oh. and walkers, um, and so it's it's going to cause even more problems than it would have done say two years ago. I'm just going through it myself. Maybe officers can give me a hand here. Yeah, I, I think looking at EM, EM, uh, EM10, sorry, um, I think it is, uh, I suppose my, my, my commentary, and again, it's just to try and assist. I think I think it is difficult to, to think of a reason for refusal that picks up on that point of, of I guess, the residents' amenity around the amount of development, which is what I'm understanding from, from Councillor Cormack's sort of comments, um, in, in, into a PIP reason for refusal, given the limitations of what is 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 is, is before you, it's it's effectively residential development being proposed within a yeah. an area. Admittedly, it's it's a countryside area, but it's nevertheless residential in character. So I think that would be an extremely challenging one to. To, to bring into a reason for refusal on a, on, on a PIP. The other two chair, as I understand it, on the on, on the table, if you like, on, on, on Councillor McCormack's motion are the conflict with policy SS6 as a matter of principle. So to do with the location simply is, in, 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 in terms of the motion, unacceptable. And the, the uh, second reason for refusal related to landscape impact. And, and effectively, Chair, the committee would need to be satisfied that the location, so just simply developing that site for the scale of the development proposed would be unacceptable outright, irrespective of what came forward at TDC stage. That's the kind of bar, if you like, to, to, to determine the application for refusal in that way. So I, I, I suppose I'd be unclear, Chair, as to how a third reason for refusal would be would, would be possible under terms of the M10, but glad to provide more advice, Chair, if, if the debate continues on that point. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor McCormack? Well, if we, if we can't find a reason in EM10, then I won't put forward EM10, but we've got two other reasons that... We've got two other reasons for refusal, right. Yeah. So, uh, SS60 in EM1 landscape. Uh, it's been properly moved and seconded for refusal. So I'll take the vote on that. Uh, Councillor Robinson? Four. Councillor Leakes. Against. Councillor Goodison. For refusal. Councillor George. For refusal. Councillor Frankham. For refusal. Councillor Harvey. You muted, mm -hmm. Councillor Harvey. I was getting there eventually against. Councillor McCormack. Four. Four. Councillor Bound. 
Against. Councillor Potter. Against. Councillor Tomlin. Against. Bernie. Five, five. <laughs> yes, that's five for the recommendation and five against the recommendation. I will vote for the recommendation for refusal. Bernie? Sorry, that's now six for the recommendation, five against. That's carried, officers. Thank you, Chairman. This that up application has been refused for two reasons on the grounds of SS6E where the location is deemed to be unacceptable and EM1 where the again the location of the development is considered to be have adverse landscape impacts thank you thank you very much members thank you very much uh, it is 2129 uh, it's been a very satisfactory committee meeting thank you very much and we meet again in April and the IT stood up tonight. Thank you very much. See you then and good night.